Hi, and welcome back to World Carers Conversation 2022. My name is Lauren Rachel St. Pierre, and I'm the Innovation Director at the National Alliance for Caregiving and your webinar host today. We've just come back from a break in our program. If you are just joining us now, I'm gonna share a brief housekeeping with you. But if you tuned in this morning for our welcome session, um, none of this will be new information to you and you still have um, a few minutes um, of break as I don't think I'll be sharing any new information with you. Today's agenda includes a combination of pre-recorded and live presentations organized around key issue areas. We already covered care or mental health and next we'll get into health system integration before finishing the day with economic security care issues. A detailed agenda is available on our event website and I'll also drop this agenda into the chat box shortly. We have many live presentations ahead these will be followed by brief question and answer periods. You can submit questions to presenters using the question box in your Zoom control panel or by submitting questions to the chat. Please note that your chat submissions are public and they can be viewed by everyone on the webinar. Our speakers will not be able to address every single question that's submitted, but they will do their best to stay on following their sessions to answer a few additional questions via the chat box. We know that this afternoon's remaining program is long and we're catching our international audience at all times of the day and night. To make it possible to share all the best parts of today with all of you, we will record this entire event and make it available in the upcoming weeks. This recording will be shared via the National Alliance for Caregiving's Facebook page as well as on our YouTube channel. If you registered for today's meeting or if you receive NAC's weekly e-newsletter this week in caregiving, you'll get a direct email from us once the recording is available. And I'm gonna drop a link to where you can join this email mailing list if you'd like to in just a moment. And finally, if you need assistance with this webinar as we move ahead this afternoon, please send a direct message through the chat to panelists and host. That message is gonna reach me and I'll do my best to assist. So with that, I'd like to turn our conversation to the topic that we're getting into now, which is integrating caregivers into health systems. So back in 2020, when NAC first hosted the first World Carers Conversation, something we heard in different ways was the challenge to providers and caregivers to include caregivers into healthcare systems and care teams in meaningful and consistent ways. We understand at NAC that there are social and economic and even ethical challenges to identifying caregivers and documenting this, such as in the electronic health record, for example. And we've heard already today about some of the cultural understandings about who is a caregiver and what is a caregiver's role and how these vary greatly. And we have more work to do to fully see and include and support the millions of family caregivers and nations around the world. COVID-19 and the necessity to practice social distancing and limit potential exposure to vulnerable people and healthcare workers revealed some of the long existing tensions um, in where caregivers show up in care teams and where their roles are vulnerable, limiting their voice, or in the case of COVID-19, their presence in some cases, um, when caregiver roles are less clear or formal. Two years later, as we revisit with intention, the place of caregivers into health and broader care teams, understanding that caregivers still lack formal and consistent roles across care settings. We asked the international caregiving community to tell us about how this looks and how it works in their nations and their health systems. So for the next couple of hours, we're going to gain different perspectives on how and where caregivers fit. You'll hear from a caregiver and caregiving leader, Lily Liu, on trauma-informed care and why this is important for successful partnering with caregivers. You'll also learn about three unique programs that recognize the needs and value caregivers bring as partners in care in different ways tailored to the particular caregivers they serve. A program for adolescent carers in South Africa, a program supporting cancer caregivers in Brazil, and a virtual program for chronic disease caregivers in the United States. And then before we move on from this topic, We'll talk with Emma Miller, Senior Research Associate from the University of Strathclyde in Scotland about the tools we can use to include carers in care conversations in appropriate roles and with care and consideration. 
Throughout these sessions, you'll hear stories from NAC's Global Voices of Caregiving project. And I'll ask my colleague Lauren to introduce and share the first story of this afternoon with you now. Hi everyone. Next, we're going to see the story of Nellie, who is a carer from Taiwan. She cares uh, for both her parents and she'll talk a little bit about some of the struggles she faced um, in the hospitals. I'm Nellie Huang from Taipei, Taiwan. I take care of my parents full time with my father's foreign caretaker. My parents are 94 years old, and they are both dementia patients. 18 years ago, my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer. My father and I take care of them together. Four and a half years ago, my father got lower limb disorders and vascular dementia due to a traumatic brain injury from an accident. So I retired in a hurry and went home to take care of them. Accident bring more shock and confusion than sickness. Both patients and the families need to face and accept challenges without preparation and without time to learn. On the third day after leaving the ICU to the general ward, the hospital informs us that my father should discharge by the next day. My dad could not move his whole body except to bend his fingers slightly. Looking at him, I was totally at a loss what to do. The doctor said that my father was out of danger and could go home but our apartment has no elevator. The doctor said that I could also send my dad to rehab, but resources are limited and I was unable to find an available hospital bed right away. In the end, I hired an ambulance to take my parents to a hotel and wait there for the hospital bed to rehabilitation. I spend a lot of time with my parents in rehab, exercise, social activities, and uh, everyday life. Although their health regressed, I try my best to maintain our daily life as before. I understand that Dementia is irreversible, and my parents are going to get worse and worse. But I also know that those feelings of happiness can last forever. All the effort is just trying to make them as happy and fearless as possible. To maintain a good relationship between patients and the caregiver, I realized that sufficient understanding and good communication are important. Every year, I plant some orange saplings on my balcony to support the caterpillars. It's joyful to see the caterpillar turn into a butterfly and fly away. Sometimes when the butterfly emerges from the cocoon, it cannot fully spread its wings and cannot fly away. So I pick the flowers it like and put the disabled butterfly on the flowers to suck the nectar. Or I dip my fingertips in honey water then feed it. After a few tries, the butterfly understood and was not afraid of my hand touching it. The essential of communication is not the language, but love, understanding, and trust.
Disabled butterflies cannot fly to the field, but at least they can live peacefully till the end in the pot of flowers and my care. My mother's memory is almost empty, but she always said that I don't know how to do it, but I'm lucky they will do it for me. I told my parents that don't worry about forgetting, but please remember we love them forever. Thank you, Nellie, for your story. If you would like to share your own photo story, you can do that by posting a picture to Twitter or Facebook that represents your vision for a world that includes and supports caregivers. And if you'd like to see your story here, be sure to tag us at NAC using the handle at NA, the number four caregiving, and use our event hashtags World Carers and WCC22. As we move ahead, we've come up to a decision point where attendees on Zoom have a choice to make about the next session they attend. If you're joining us via Facebook Live, and if you stay right where you are on Zoom, you're going to hear a session next from Lily Liu, a family caregiver and consultant, about her personal caregiving journey and the role of trauma-informed care and what we can draw on from both in how we support carers and take care of ourselves as caregivers. If you're on Zoom, you'll have a choice to attend an alternative session at the same time from Lorani Maria Santos about a support program for people with cancer in Brazil. Lorani's session will be shared in her language, Portuguese, and can be viewed with Portuguese audio and subtitles or Portuguese audio and auto-translated English subtitles via the link I'll provide in the chat box shortly. If you're joining us via Facebook or wish to stay and hear Lily Liu on trauma-informed care, stay put. And if you're interested in Lorani Maria Santos's session on her organization's support program for cancer caregivers, look for a link shortly to leave this webinar and view that session. If you attend the alternative session, don't forget to rejoin me here for our main program once that session is complete. We're now gonna to transition to the session, A Lesson Learned, Trauma-Informed Care. Lily Liu is a family caregiver and a consultant in the United States who has prepared a session on trauma-informed care, why this is so important for caregivers and those who support and interact with them to understand. And she's gonna tell it through her family's personal story, which captures Lily's unique and intersecting identities as a caregiver, as a daughter, as a Chinese American, and as an immigrant in a way only Lily can. So let's hear now from Lily and as we do, <laughs> Please submit your questions for Lily via the questions box or the chat because Lily is going to join us live following her session to answer a few questions for us. Hello, everyone. My name is Lily Liu, and it's a great honor to be with all of you at this 2022 World Cares Conversation. I am delighted to be able to bring you a lesson learned that I have learned as I've learned about this concept of trauma-informed care. I am the dragon daughter caregiver. As you can see, I proudly wear a dragon pin because it has been a journey turning from, evolving from the dragging daughter to become the dragon daughter. Originally, as a family caregiver for my mother, I was dragging with fatigue, dragging with worry, dragging with uncertainty. But once I empowered myself with information and education and resources, I am proudly now the dragon daughter caregiver. It is so important on our journey as family caregivers to empower ourselves, seek information, research for resources, it is a journey from one state of being to another, and this journey can be much easier if we empower ourselves with information and resources. For my case, it would be a disease-specific association that I can start with. My mother has Parkinson's, so of course I sought out all the information that's available, and there is so much. We're so lucky that there are disease-specific associations to help all of us as we give care. For example, for Parkinson's, 
I was able to find out that there is a free kit and it, inside were so many resources that helped me. If you have a loved one who is suffering from diabetes, if there are heart issues as you care for a loved one, if there's Alzheimer's issues, please seek out disease specific associations and resources. You will feel so empowered. There are also benefits that your loved one and you as a caregiver might be eligible for. So research away, you will feel so much more empowered and could also evolve from dragging with fatigue, dragging with worry, dragging with uncertainty to become a dragon son, daughter, spouse, family caregiver. I wanted to tell the story that another resource came into my toolkit as a family caregiver. Last year, a friend on the West Coast who works with an organization called Happy 50 Plus, which is doing such wonderful things for Chinese Americans, they said, oh, there's going to be a conference. And someone from the Jewish Federations of North America would like someone who's Asian American to be part of the conference. I was so honored that I was accepted onto the panel. And our panel talked about trauma-informed care, a concept that I had not been aware of before. And once I learned about it, heard from my fellow panelists, it opened up so many new concepts that have helped me during the past year as a family caregiver. Today, as we're together, it is not only Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, it's also Jewish American Heritage Month. And of course, May has always been Older Americans Month. And it is also Mental Health Awareness Month. I wanted to mention this because the intersection of all of these months is what I'm dealing with as a family caregiver. And each of these concepts have helped me so much as I care for my loved one, my elderly mother. By knowing now more about trauma-informed care, I have been able to take what I've learned and apply it as a family caregiver daily as I care for my mom. It is, of course, important to say that the trauma-informed care originated brilliantly as Holocaust survivors' families try to help them as they age. It is a framework, though, that we can learn from. And I must say it has helped me so much because it has given me new insights as I care for my mom. So everyone has their own lived experience as a caregiver, as a family caregiver. The story that I'm telling is mine. In a way though, we all share the same experience because as you know, an early advocate and champion of us, Mrs. Rosalind Carter, the former first lady, I love what she has always taught us, the wisdom that there really are only four kinds of people in the world, right? Those who have been caregivers, those who currently are caregivers like me, those who will be caregivers, and those, all of us, who one day will need caregivers. So what I'm sharing today is my own experience and how having different tools in my toolbox as a family caregiver has strengthened me and help me each and every day. I realize the power of storytelling because I have gone on stage to share my story. Originally, I began using PowerPoints with lots of data, lots of statistics. And by the third slide, I think the audience's eyes glazed over. So I realized it was important to share the authentic story of my own journey as a family caregiver. And I've actually started writing about it because in the Chinese American community, we often talk about the tiger mother. But now with the aging of America, I've said the title of this one article was forget about the tiger mothers. What about us dragging dragon daughters and sons and spouses? The demographic change means there will be more and more caregiving by family members and friends in the Chinese American and Asian American community. 
So I actually parse out my profile very, very distinctly. I came to America as a young child. So I am what the sociologists say is a 1.5 generation immigrant. I came as a young child, but I grew up in America. So I'm different from the first generation who came born somewhere else like my parents. And I would be different than the 2.0, the second generation who are born in America. So because I'm a 1.5 generation child of immigrants, I have tried very hard throughout my life to learn our heritage language, which in our family is Mandarin Chinese, because I knew that it would be important to be able to communicate with my parents as they aged. And I'm so glad that I have. Chinese is a very difficult language to learn. I may not be able to write or read it as well as a native Chinese person, but at least I am functionally able to speak it, which is key as a family caregiver, especially when you go to doctor's offices and have to interpret for your elderly loved one. I am a family caregiver, and that's important because I've always said we have to name it if you're taking someone to a doctor's appointment, if you're bringing food over, if you're helping someone with their medications, you are a caregiver. It's important to name what you are. And then another part of my profile is I'm of Chinese heritage, born to parents who were originally from China. And so that is a whole nother cultural, some can say baggage, or an identity that is very, very different as I do family caregiving. And I am the daughter of two parents. I've already lost my father. So my mother is the one I'm caring for now. They, because 20th century Asia was all about conflict, war, strife. I am the daughter, family caregiver of a parent who survived multiple wars in China escaped from communism, literally on foot, given one night to leave or to stay, and my mother chose to leave. They also had a refugee camp situation, detained there for five years. They have been exiled from their original homeland, and now they've been aging, and my father died as part of a diaspora community. So you can see how what I am, my profile, brings a lot of different aspects to my family caregiving role. As I mentioned, so much of 20th century Asia history, world history, was about strife and war, which meant going from places to escape to places of safety. That, of course, then has had huge impact on my family history. Both my parents were refugee students. So I had a double dose of parents who had to flee from somewhere to somewhere. So the trauma-informed care has brought so many insights as I take care of my mother daily. So the story of our family begins in China. My parents were born there and their home province was in the middle of China, which means they could not escape communism easily by taking a boat. So what they had to do was literally in the fall of 1948, make a decision overnight to go as high school students with their school, which was going to protect them as they were fleeing or stay. And my mother and both my father who were not married at that time they were just high school students. Each of them said, it is better for us to go and not stay and suffer what would happen after the communists took over their hometown. They left their families behind and most of their family members they never saw again. And so it took them about 10 months to go south, literally on foot climbing mountains. Some friends fell off cliffs. Some friends died. Some classmates made the decision to turn back. 
but my mother and my father kept going. I often have asked my mother, what kept you going through all this difficulty? And she had said, and always says, I knew what lay ahead would be better than what was behind me. So this was a journey, an escape of thousands of miles. They made their way over the border into French Indochina, today Vietnam, but at that time still a French colony. The French didn't know what to do with this huge influx of refugees. So, you know, now we're talking in 2022, we're seeing that exact situation play out in world history again, sadly. The implications for my mother and father were, they were in the French colony, the French did not know what to do with this huge group of refugees. They put them in what I call refugee concentration camps. And I use that word concentration camp advisedly, meaning that they were concentrated as refugees in one spot. They had to build their own thatch roof huts. And so I now, because I understand trauma-informed care better, realized that my mother's Parkinson's disease could perhaps originate from that era. Among that group of refugee students, there are many of them who are not blood related, but many have Parkinson's. Mother had said that every so often, because they were you know, just out in the open, they had lice, they had bugs, so they were stood up against a wall every so often and just sprayed with DDT to quote unquote, clean them off. So, you know, I think perhaps that group of refugee students, their Parkinson's disease could perhaps relate to that toxin. The students all because of vitamin deficiency got night blindness. My mother and her fellow girl students, girl classmates, their periods ended, and I have since found out that menstruation stops in times of trauma. So, so much of trauma-informed care now makes sense to me as I look at my mother as she ages and the medical situations that I have to deal with. Fortunately, after four and a half, almost five years, this group of refugee students, they were finally rescued and taken in the dark of night secretly to Taiwan. I was born there, and that is where our family was for about eight years or so. My father was a good student, so he tested well, and he came abroad to get his graduate degree. So there I am at the airport the day that we flew out to come to America. We emigrated from Taiwan and immigrated to the United States of America. From that day, I changed from being Liu Yijun to now Lily Lu. So my identity is very wrapped up in the immigrant experience. And in a blink of an eye, the woman who cared for me as a young baby, now I am caring for her. I am a daughter, family caregiver. When trauma-informed care concepts came into my radar, I said, oh my goodness, that is such an important concept because all these years when I took mother to the doctors, there's always an intake form, right? They ask for your medical history and there's always a page that asks for family medical history. I've always left it blank. We have no information beyond the generation of my parents. So trauma-informed care taught me this is part of the situation when you are part of a diaspora, when you are survivors of war, you do not have immediate family medical history. So in my caregiving journey, which began, you know, hands-on care for mom about 12 years ago, I reached out because I know that there are many people who've written books and they've been so helpful. And yet I said to myself, I need to understand though, what is different when you are an immigrant family caregiver, when you come from a different cultural and linguistic background? What's different? 
and why? So I've thought about all of this and I realized that when you're an immigrant family, you come as a nuclear family, a father, a mother, some children perhaps, and then later after they have immigrated, they may have other children. So the problem now at this end of life is there's so few hands on deck. I do not have a cousin Sue that I can call from Iowa to come and give me two weeks of respite. We're a nuclear family, just me, siblings, parents, and that's it. It has huge implications for what I call the number of possibilities of members on a caregiving team. And then of course, the most important thing is when you have a heritage language Throughout our lives, so many Chinese Americans, Asian Americans, other immigrants have said the power dynamic changes when you're a young child and you have to interpret for your adult family member because their English may not be fluent. And then I always say the interpretation that's needed for medical language, even if you are fluent in English, there are so many acronyms, so many technical terms, you need an interpreter in English for medical language. What is a UTI? What is an MRI? What are ADLs? UTI, urinary tract infection. I finally learned that. ADLs, activities of daily living. So the point is there are such barriers when you are a family caregiver. And then of course, I've heard on many virtual events recently during this pandemic, the aspects of mental health and how so many younger Asian Americans have said, my parents, my grandparents have never opened up about their years of trauma. Also, the parents may not be able to share because the younger generation may not know the heritage language. So I realized that I, as a 1.5 generation immigrant child, who has worked very hard to learn the heritage language can act as a bridge. I must help both generations, the elders and the younger ones because of this linguistic and cultural gap. The language gap is huge because if you cannot verbalize so that your child or grandchild understands all the war and strife and unrest that you've experienced, then your story is not preserved, not understood. I am very, very happy that my mother, who wrote down a memoir in the mid 1980s, but in Chinese, it just sat in a box for literally decades. But two years ago, I brought down the box, I sent it to a publisher in Taiwan, and it is now published as a book so that her story is not lost. Her story of survival, her story of trauma, her story of being able to overcome everything that she did in her flight to freedom and opportunity. So that is why I have worked so hard is we must make sure however we can that our elder stories are preserved. Now, what about the cultural gap? That is huge. I know that there's no way that I can understand all the complexities of some of the things my mother actually has done. When we were young, one day she woke up and she would not speak to us. And then she quickly wrote something down on a sheet of paper and taped it to the window. We had no idea what was happening. Later, she explained that it was her family's cultural tradition that if you had a bad dream, a nightmare, you must write it down, put it on somewhere where sunlight can be exposed to it and never speak until it's been done. But can you imagine how traumatizing it was for us kids to wake up to this? We had absolutely no clue what was happening. And now that we understand the cultural traditions that she inherited, it made better sense. But how do you explain that? We, we had no concept of mental health, 
having maybe therapy from my parents, all that they went through. My father dealt with his war trauma in a very different way. Now, as I look back, he has since passed away. I, if I had been aware of trauma-informed care, could I have provided better care to him as a family caregiver towards the end of his life? Anybody who's aware of the Confucian concept of filial piety, the word in Mandarin is pronounced xiao, knows in a way the weight of literally 5,000 years of historical tradition and cultural values. Respect for your elders and perhaps an expectation of caring for them when they are aging. I wonder what it must be like for parents and grandparents who have no way to verbalize what they think they expect and then the younger children and grandchildren who may not even be aware of concepts or these values and what that would mean to the care and the giving of care in future decades. And because of the pandemic and being able to participate in so many virtual events, I've understood the othering concept now, if you have uh, children who are othering your parents and grandparents, what will that mean when they get older and there is care needed? And of course, the identity, assimilation, acculturation issues between generations of immigrants and what the implications are for giving care. So what I wanted to bring to this today is to say that more attention needs to be Sean on first generation immigrant elders and the implications for successive generations in their families, especially in the context of caregiving. So I am just going to say that thank goodness I now have this concept of trauma informed care is like another tool in the toolbox as I give care and as I advise others who often seek my advice. We all know that giving care is so difficult. There are so many things you have to take care of emotionally, physically, spiritually, financially, mental health wise. It is not easy. It's more than just a one <laughs> seat or two seat seesaw. I call it a multiple seesaw. So having trauma informed care concepts has really helped me a lot as I try to seek some balance. And I'm so glad that this conference is sponsored and supported by folks who understand that you have to name it. There's actually that wonderful survey, how you can, by looking at the situations, say, am I a caregiver? And you'll realize you are a family caregiver. If you're bringing soup to a neighbor, if you're helping with medications, if you're driving a loved one to a doctor's appointment, I've often said you can't Google all those things, but once you Google, I am a family caregiver, so many resources and so much information becomes available. And of course, we must acknowledge the huge implications for all of us as caregivers during this pandemic. I made the decision not to bring in extra help for fear of the risk of infection of people coming in and out. So I have been giving care by myself 24 seven, I think now for about 18 months. So of course that raises the question of self-care. We all know how people talk about, put your oxygen mask on yourself first. So many people have asked though, how, when can we give ourselves self-care? And I realized that trauma-informed care really helps me understand that I cannot measure my own resilience against the parameters of my mother who had to climb mountains, escape on foot thousands of miles. I myself must give myself grace and compassion that when I'm running on empty, I don't have to measure myself against all that a mother would have gone through. This is my own story and my own situation. So what I have learned from friends is there's a friend who actually says, I go every night 
<laughs> for 15 minutes into my dark closet. That's not a photo of his closet. But he says, I just get so much strength and rejuvenation from sitting in a dark closet for 15 minutes. I myself have been advised by friends that there are aromatherapy oils and they've been really wonderful. And I found this clearance sale. I think it's called a pink Himalayan salt light. And I turn it on and it brings such comfort and peace to me when there's a caregiving moment that is a little bit overwhelming. I would like to thank the sponsors of this very important 2022 World Carers Conversation Conference. I was honored to be invited to share my own lived experience. I feel it is very important for us, if we can, to help enhance diverse representation about issues of family caregiving. I invite you to join me and become also a Dragon Family Caregiver. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lily, for this presentation and also for answering some questions um, because I know you're here with us live and you've answered some questions in the chat. Um, so we appreciate you being here. It's nice to see you on Zoom. We have time for just a single question with you live. And I wanted to ask you about stories. Um, so you taught us today through your story and you also spoke about publishing your mother's memoir. And NAC has made Care Stories part of our program today through the Global Voices of Caregiving Project. So I have to ask you to tell us why stories? What is the power of stories to the caregiving movement? Thank you so much, first of all, for the honor of joining everyone literally around the world. My heart has been so full looking at the stories, hearing the stories shared so far. I think it's a primal need that we have as human beings to hear story. For me, though, I think the most important thing that I wish to use storytelling for is the transfer of knowledge and wisdom. So many people in America, because we came very early as immigrants, are what I call in the pipeline, aging behind my mother and me as the family caregiver. So the transfer of information and wisdoms through storytelling is very key. And I really honor what the National Alliance for Caregiving is doing by not only collecting stories from all over the world, but preserving them. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Lily. And if you're able to stay with us, I think there's some comments for you in, in the comment area and um, some additional questions that are coming through. But your comments are a great transition for us to actually hear another story um, from the Global Voices of Caregiving Project, this time from Mr. Terashima. So let's hear Mr. Terashima talk about his experience giving care to his wife in Japan and the community supports that assist them.私たち夫婦は共に今新型
体力、気力の温存となって、これからも頑張って、いつまで続けられるかと不安は感じながらも、老老介護に励んでいきたいと思っております。Great, and thank you, Mr. Terashima, for your story. Our next live session is Why Care South Africa, developing young carer education and support programs in South Africa. I want to welcome now two experts who are going to share more information about their focus on young caregivers in South Africa, why the needs the Why Care program are addressing are significant, and how this program is meeting them. So let me first welcome Dr. Franslo Henning. Dr. Henning is an associate professor and consultant neurologist in the Department of Medicine at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. He'll be joined by Dr. Melinda Cavanaugh, professor of social work at the Helen Bader School of Social Welfare at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in the United States. I know Drs. Henning and Kavanaugh have a lot of information to share with us. We've given them just a short amount of time today, so I want to turn things over now to Dr. Kavanaugh to begin. Hello. There I am. <laughs> Hello, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, present this really wonderful data and to really be able to talk about this amazing collaboration that we have not only with uh, Dr. Henning, but many of our other colleagues in South Africa. Um, next slide, please. So just a brief overview, we're going to talk about um, not only the Y Care program, but we situate it within um, ALS and motor neuron disease. And Dr. Henning is going to spend some time talking about that in a moment. We'll talk about uh, young caregivers in general in South Africa, our pilot study data, the Y Care program in general, and how we're adapting it to the South African culture. And I think that's a really important piece and we'll certainly spend time on that um, and the value of really listening to the community and to the caregivers and the families there in South Africa and then discuss our next steps. Next slide, please. I'll turn it over to Dr. Henning. Dr. Henning, I, it looks like you're, you're still muted. muted. Oh, okay. We can hear you now, thank you. <laughs> you're muted again, Franzlo. Now? Yes. Okay. Hello, welcome. <laughs> right. Hi guys, um, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's a good evening from uh, the southern tip of South Africa where it's already after seven in the evening. Uh, it's a privilege to join you. As Melinda said, um, I'm going to start telling you a little bit about the disease itself. I'm at ALS. Um, I realize that we have a very diverse um, audience here, so it's probably good to start with some background info. Um, so in the United States, ALS is mostly known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, rest of the world, motor neuron disease, ALS. And it's a degenerative disease that affects motor neurons. In other words, those cells that or nerve cells that innervate muscles. So these neurons progressively degenerate and it just leads to weakness of most or all voluntary muscles eventually. Um, this weakness affects limb muscles, respiration, swallowing, speech, and on average survival is between two and five years from symptom onset. Uh, another way to look at it is about 20% of people survive longer than five years from symptom onset, about 10% longer than 10 years. The average age of onset differs between world regions, and it's you, most regions but in the early 60s, early to mid 60s. Um, and as the disease progresses, the need for assistance increases, and this responsibility usually rests on the spouse um, or other family members. These responsibilities would include feeding, dressing, personal hygiene, transfer between bed, chair, shower, uh, medication management, management of secretions, and very often also management of devices like non-invasive ventilation. Next slide, please. So this was a what's shown at the moment on the screen is a study that we did looking at uh, motor neuron disease in South Africa, not only the incidence, but also what was striking um, is the difference in age of onset. Um, and that has, has some bearing on our 
project, and I'll get to that in a second, but it seems like the incidence of Africa is much lower than most other regions. And this seems to be mostly because of the apparent lower incidence in the people of African and mixed African, European slash Asian ancestry. Um, at the same time, the disease appears to, be, to present at a much earlier age in these population groups. Next slide, please. So as you can see on this slide, uh, there's significant difference in age of onset between the different population groups. Uh, so young onset LS is defi defined as below the age of 45. And while in most regions in the world, this, is, um, the, this group makes up about 10% of cases, in South Africa, a third of the African population and a quarter of the mixed ancestry population that develop ALS develops is at the age below 45. So a large number of young onset. And the, the consequence of this is that a higher proportion of people with ALS will have young children in the household. Unfortunately, these two population groups are also the socioeconomically disadvantaged population groups. And this puts an even greater burden of care on the family members as they are unable to, to afford outside assistance. And many of these families, because the spouse becomes the sole breadwinner, children assume the responsibility of care, which impacts on their schooling. And unfortunately, the educational system in our country is not able to compensate for this by means of homeschooling programs, for example. Another factor that potentially impacts on, on family members is the stigmatization of people with, with ALS. In some communities, people with illnesses, especially chronic illnesses, may be regarded as being cursed. And I've also come across people with ALS reporting being isolated in the community because for the layperson, the appearance of someone with ALS is fairly similar to one with advanced HIV infection. This is probably not a common phenomenon, but it has come up in discussions. Unfortunately, we as neurologists pay very little attention to anyone but the person with ALS sitting in front of us in the clinic. So in fact, we are usually not even aware of the impact on the disease, of the disease on the family members, especially the children, because they generally don't attend clinic with their parents. So we don't even consider a potential impact on them. And I have to say, working on this project has made me much more aware of this, and I hope that we will learn what we learn will, will enable us to address this in the future. I would now I'd like to hand back over to Dr. Kavanagh for a few slides just to give us some background information on the work that's already been done in the United States. Thank you, Dr. Henning. Next slide, please. So this, um, this is an outgrowth of the work that I've been doing for many years as a licensed clinical social worker with an expertise in neurological disorders. I've studied many, many complex disorders, including ALS. And we did a national study on ALS in the United States, um, really trying to understand how many children and youth are participating in care, what kind of care they're participating in. And we found that care is, is occurring, quite frankly, often daily for upwards of five hours a day. Um, almost half of the children who participated in this study were younger than 12 years old, which can often be surprising. Some people um, do want to, to make assumptions that it's uh, only a teenager or a young adult. But in fact, we had children as young as six years old in this national study who were identified not only by their family, but by themselves as participating in care. And as Dr. Henning said, um, AL is very, very complicated and does end up requiring um, full 24-hour care. So this is not care that is um, uh, that, that doesn't happen outside of the adult population or outside of the youth population. So basically something that Dr. Becker said earlier in the day, anything that an adult does to provide care, a child or a youth is doing it as well. And we found all of that in our study here in the U.S. However, what we know is that outside of the U.S., the, the, the complexity of care still exists, but we just don't understand about what's going on in the young carer population, um, including in the very complex um, setting as Dr. Henning just mentioned. So I'll turn it back to Dr. Henning for a moment. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so in, in South Africa, very little is known about the impact of chronic illnesses on youth households, um, on, on, on households, and many of these are youth-headed. Um, however, there's a growing 
body of work on impact of age on, on families, in particular the effect of age oftener on children's health. Um, the pivotal study on this was the Young Carers SA Research Group's baseline study, which is called the Mental Health of Age Orphan Children Study. This was published in 2009, and it showed that children orphaned by age were significantly worse off psychologically than children orphaned by other chronic illnesses and non-orphans. And this was due notably to stigma, abuse, and peer factors. And four years later, um, there was a follow-up project called the Resilience Study, and this project identified additional significant risk group, which were the children who were age affected. And the definition of what this was that they might be age orphaned, have age themselves, are living with someone with age, or are caring for age sick parents or caregivers. This study showed that such age affected children were worse off even more than orphans as a consequence of the burden involved in caring for age uh, sick parents or caregivers. And then the subsequent study, the Young Carers study, uh, then ran from 2010 to 2012, um, and built on the findings of the resilience study. And it aimed to identify the impact of being a young care on children's well-being in age-affected families. Over 6,000 children and 2,500 caregivers were interviewed in South African in, in provinces in South African provinces. Um, three different provinces, and this was the world's largest study on children in age-affected families. Um, the findings from the study continue to influence policies and programming and planning for children and adults and communities affected by HIV and AIDS at both uh, local level, provincial in South Africa, as well as national government, and also worldwide, including the WHO and USAID, as well as Save the Children and UNICEF. And given that an estimated 85 million children of the sub-Saharan Africa are age affected, um, this data is clearly very, very important. Now, the, the YK program um, will clearly not involve nearly such large numbers of, of young carers as AL. It is a very rare disease, but it will definitely generate some novel data on specifically neurological illness like ALS that hopefully can inform planning and policies and especially training of families um, and community workers, as well as healthcare practitioners like myself. Next slide, please. Briefly, um, the, the, the South African team consists of myself. I'm based in Cape Town at uh, Tigerberg Hospital in Stellenbosch University. Then uh, there's uh, Dr. Mocken and Dr. Smith at, um, in jo Johannesburg at Chris Honeyberg Wanoff. There's the MND Association of South Africa and their care coordinators. And then lastly, but um, suffice to say, most important in this case, um, Melinda Cavanaugh, who will be take over for me now, um, and Miranda Wensloff in, in, in Wisconsin, Milwaukee, who initiated this project and, and brought us on board. And we, we are very thankful for that. So I hand back over to Melinda. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Henning. Next slide, please. So um, we'll just briefly go over our initial pilot data. So this was uh, captured well before COVID, and this was the first data that had ever been captured on children and family caregivers in ALS and motor neuron disease in South Africa. And quite frankly, um, South <laughs> Sub-Saharan Africa, quite frankly. Um, the exciting thing about this data collection is that we were able to travel throughout both the um, Cape Town and Johannesburg regions. And we met with families in their homes, in their communities. We interviewed them about care. We asked them about the role that their child or youth or grandchild played in the care um, of their ALS. Next slide, please. So you'll see that we have information on both um, the adult and the youth, and this has been published um, a few years ago. So we interviewed 20 families in these regions. We found children as young as nine and as old as 20 who were participating in care. And as I said earlier, as reflected in the US data, um, children and youth are doing every type of care that an adult would do. And as Dr. Henning mentioned, um, this is truly primarily because of lack of access 
to other individuals to help with care, as well as lack of access to um, services and supports and devices and whatnot. Um, we did have a, a pretty diverse um, sample in our population. We only had one adult who had any education past high school, but we did have um, several individuals who identified as black, white, colored, other. So we were able to get a pretty um, diverse uh, understanding of those experiences. Next slide, please. So what we found is that youth are spending um, a very large amount of time providing care, again, reflective in the US data. Um, most of them described feeling really overwhelmed and asking for assistance with hands-on care. Um, both the adults and the youth um, identified the lack of supports, the lack of assistance, um, and that they, they felt almost bad that the youth was participating or taking on so much care. But the truth is, is that they didn't have any sort of financial um, supports, any sort of outside supports or access. And the youth identified a really strong sense of responsibility. They felt um, almost uniformly that they needed to be participating in care and that that was really important to them. But the thing that we're gonna talk about next is captured in this last um, bit of information. And that is that the majority of youth had never received any sort of training or any sort of guidance or any sort of um, information about the care that they were actively daily providing. Next slide, please. And just really briefly why we should care about this. And, and this really comes from the adult caregiving literature. We know that um, when that caregiving experience um, is their skills provided to that experience, when there's a skill oriented training program, we know that that has a very definitive impact on the well being. It reduces anxiety and it reduces depression in adults. And what's really critical is the inclusion of support in those programs that the these caregivers are not going through any sort of education or training by themselves. Yet again, um, we see that these adult training programs are again focused on adults and do not include any youth or children in them. Next slide. So this slide represents data from um, multiple neurological disorders um, that I've been doing research on with young carers across the US for many years. And if you ask children and youth how they know what they're doing, um, this is also published data, but they, they have every response other than someone actually taught me how to do it. And the truth is, is that in addition to not only not knowing how to do the kinds of tasks that they're doing, what we're also finding is that they do have elevated anxiety, they do have lots of concern, and they do have um, a lowered confidence, particularly in such complex disorders like ALS or other complex neurological disorders like Huntington's disease or Parkinson's disease. Next slide. So as a result of this kind of information and this kind of data, uh, my team and I have been spending many years um, trying to figure out what's the best way to address this. And we have several publications. We've been testing something that we call YCARE, and it's a youth caregiving training skills and support program. And it's initially situated in the ALS community, but we have also tested it in Alzheimer's and related dementia. And it's a modular um, program that we can take out different skills and add in other skills as they relate to different disorders, different communities, and different care needs. Next slide, please. So you'll see that the modular nature is we have basic care skills. We talk about communication and feeding. We talk about assistive devices if they're needed for whatever the disorder is. But the real key piece, and I'll talk about this even more, is that there's a support piece and that these young caregivers are brought together to develop that peer-to-peer -peer connection, which so many youth in all of the studies that I've conducted over the years say is really that key missing piece. They don't have peers who get it. They don't have peers who are part of that um, situation, that care situation. And so bringing them together to not only learn skills, but to learn from each other and build those relationships is critical. And all of these trainings are provided by professionals. So we work collaboratively with occupational therapy, physiotherapy, speech language pathology, respiratory, social work, and neurology uh, with Dr. Henning. Next slide, please. 
So this is just a brief breakdown. I won't spend too much time on it because I want to get to um, the actual meat of what we've been doing with uh, South Africa. But what it shows is that the key elements of it are not only that peer engagement, but that youth can go in and they can touch any sort of device. They can ask any sort of question. And those therapists are there to really guide them and start where they're at. What do the youth know? How have they been participating in care? What are some of the skills? What are some of their concerns? What are some of their worries? So it provides this um, kind of a holistic wraparound support and training and education and peer, peer, peer um, with these youth. Next slide, please. But what we found is you know, this is a program that was developed in the United States, um, uh, a, a country that has a lot. Um, we have access to allied health professionals, any number of them. We have access to durable medical equipment, um, even in more rural or underserved areas. And so what we needed to know is how can we adapt this to the South African context? Do we need to tweak it in what ways? Do we need to kind of start from scratch? And so before COVID, um, we met with allied health professionals, we met with families, we talked with them about how might a program like this be delivered. And the feedback was really quite clear that it needs to be done in the community, by the community, for the community. And we need to be flexible with the providers. So in the US context, we assume we're gonna have all of these healthcare professionals. Well, in some of these South African contexts, we might not have all of them. We might not have but one. We might only have a physiotherapist. So that we need to be flexible and work with whoever is there, is available, and is interested and, and, and can participate. Um, they requested a book. They wanted something to hands on, to touch, to look through all the pictures, to say, what does it look like to provide care? How can I um, share this? And then lastly, it was really important to develop a program that was family uh, collaborative. So in the US, we're really very focused on the youth. But um, in South Africa, we're very focused on the family as a whole. Next slide, please. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I was looking at my time. <laughs> we could talk forever on this. Um, so here's the here's the manual that we created. And this was a very collaborative effort. So it was with Dr. Henning and his team at Tigerberg. It was with the Motor Neuron Disease Association in South Africa. It was with the care coordinators, the physiotherapists, the social workers, and everyone really had a hand in it to say, how can we make this as culturally responsive and um, appropriate as possible? And that included everything from the wording to the pictures, to how big it is, to how small it is. Um, so I'll just go through some of, the, um, some of the, the slides to show you what we created. Next slide, please. So you'll see at the beginning, um, we spend a lot of time in this module talking about spirituality and culture, which are huge aspects um, of the community. I know Dr. Henning alluded to this earlier that a lot of the stigma and isolation that families feel um, have to do with um, kind of spiritual assumptions as to how you got ALS, uh, which leads to a fair amount of family isolation. So we address that straight away. We address that right at the beginning. Beginning. We provide opportunity for children to draw and show us where on their loved one's body do they see ALS. And that will help us as the, as the support and as the community understand where do we need to kind of target some of these um, education and skill programs. Next slide, please. Um, and one of the primary things is basic care skills. And what we know here in the US is we have lots of really great devices. We have grabbers and lifters and walkers and all of these canes. Well, we might not have them in some of the communities that we work in in South Africa. So one of the key points is to help children understand what are some of the home things that they can use to help someone? What are some of the ways to roll a towel as opposed to using kind of a formal assistive device? And in the skill, in the skill book, we give them the opportunity to kind of write, like, what did I learn? What did I not learn? Draw pictures about how they felt about all of these tasks. So it gives them that opportunity to learn from someone, to try it out, to test it in the setting, and then also provide their own kind of feeling and response um, as they move through these different tasks. Next slide, please. 
Um, communication and feeding is very, very important in ALS. Um, and there's lots of different ways to understand swallowing impairment, um, understanding the thickness of liquid, the thinness of liquid. And this is something that's very specific to ALS. But when we do it in our Alzheimer's and related dementia community, we don't do this module, we do something different. So it provides us that flexibility. But in this, what we do is we, we talk about how can you adapt different things at home to create um, an easier way for your loved one to swallow when they're having difficulty swallowing different textures or um, different types of food, wrapping things, wrapping handles of silverware to make them easier to handle. So all of this is very, very, very hands-on. It's very, um, it's very engaging and it requires and encourages those children and youth to touch everything and ask questions and figure out and process with um, those healthcare providers the best way that they can be a part of this care situation. Next slide, please. So you'll see the food, we, we've adapted it to make sure that we're really being um, culturally specific with the kinds of foods that children would be eating and their family members would be um, enjoying. So, you know, these are pages that show us just pictures of their favorite kinds of foods. They can write what their favorite kind of food is, and maybe they can talk about what kind of favorite food that their loved one is, um, enjoys. And so that we can talk about the different textures and what's easier to help them um, kind of eat and swallow and what questions they might have about that. Next slide, please. Something that's also really complex is respiratory with ALS. And this is where um, youth can actually try out the different uh, respiratory machines. They can put them on their face and say, this is what it feels like to have something maybe breathe for you. That way the youth are, are their anxiety is lessened and they're more comfortable with being around those kinds of devices as opposed to the fear of I'm going to touch it and I'm going to break it and I'm going to harm my loved one. And so it's really about um, alleviating anxiety and fear in those children and youth. Next slide, please. The same thing for the assistive devices. So many of our um, loved ones with ALS will end up requiring to use a wheelchair or some other device to get around. So it lets our children be able to have access to it and see what it looks like, how do I use it? And in many instances, and we certainly found this in our um, earlier study, a lot of our family members with ALS don't have access to any sort of a power chair, which leads us to the next slide, please which is understanding pressure care. And this is this can be a really complex discussion because you know this is also understanding that children and youth, particularly in this setting, are very much a part of that healthcare team. And they might be dealing with uh, a loved one with pressure sores because of the lack of mobility associated with ALS and also the lack of access to um, uh, accessible wheelchairs uh, and transferring devices, their loved one might be in one position for an extended period. So how does that child need to help move and transfer and make sure that they're um, alleviating some of those pressure cares? And, and it's it's interesting because in the US, this is, this is not something we see as often Often, because we have so much access to um, different uh, um, accessible devices and wheelchairs and different ways to move around. But as we saw just in those 20 families that we interviewed, um, the majority of them really struggled with accessing any sort of transferring chair, wheelchair, walker at all. So, um, so this was a very, very large issue in these communities. Next slide, please. And last but not least at all is that peer engagement piece. Um, we actually just did a test of the YCARE program in Texas here in the United States. And all of the youth, um, none of the youth who participated knew each other before the program. And at the end of the day, they were all exchanging phone numbers and um, calling each other their best friends. And um, I've actually even heard that some of the youth have been um, meeting up and they've really built these peer engagement um, pieces. And that's 
that's what is so, so critical about this program and what, what we're very excited to do in South Africa is that so many of these families are so socially isolated, not the least of which is because of um, concerns about the disease. How did they get it? What does it look like? Um, so it leaves the families without that um, peer engagement, without that community engagement. So our goal, um, one of our key goals is to really build that peer and community engagement among both the children and the family members. Next slide, please. And then we also talk very openly and very honestly about how they feel about caregiving. And one of the things that um, comes up a lot when I present my research on children and youth who are caregivers, particularly the youngest ones, you know, six, eight, 10 year olds, um, is that they're very concerned that they um, don't have that opportunity to really express how they feel about it. And I think the MeWe program that was presented earlier does an excellent job of, of highlighting the need to really address the mental health issues and the support and the opportunity to talk to people about it. So that is very much embedded in this program. Next slide, please. So our next steps um, here in just a couple of months, we will be working with both the Stellenbosch and the Witz Waters Run to train um, the community and the staff who are going to participate in the Y Care program. Uh, we're going to be working directly with families throughout the different regions and continue to adapt and include adults in the training session. And then also translate the manual into um, just a few of the 11 uh, official languages in South Africa to make sure that we are constantly constantly um, being very culturally responsive to the needs of the community um, and these children and families. Next slide. I think I'm at the very end of my slide. Um, these are books that are based on my previous research and they've actually been translated into multiple different languages so that um, there's much more accessible support for children and youth and families living with ALS uh, around the world. So if anybody's interested in those or needs those, I'm happy to connect you and last slide. Thank you very much um, to our amazing, amazing team um, and everyone who worked with us on this project. I feel like I talked super fast. Thank you very much. You did great. Thank you, Dr. Henning. And thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh, for that presentation um, and introducing us to this program. Um, we have just a few minutes here, so I invited the audience to share questions they might have for you while you're with us live through the mm -hmm. Q&A box. And one has come in through the chat that I'll, I'll post to both of you. Um, there was a question from Jerry Lynn about whether you mainly match or connect um, carers with a peer, or do you also train any of the peers to be peer mentors? It's a really good question. So we aren't, we, we don't target a match. We invite as many families as possible to come and join the program. And then the children can be able to build that peer engagement there. Um, but absolutely a next step is to have peer mentors and have peers really working with peers to be trained to support and provide that training. And particularly in the South African context where we might have fewer healthcare professionals and it's really uh, the community that provides that support. Dr. Henning, I didn't know if you wanted to say anything else. No, no, no nothing to add. <laughs> Great, thanks for answering that question. And I know that both of you have provided contact information. So I've dropped your email contacts into the chat as well as the YCARE website where I think Dr. Kavanaugh, some of those resources we just saw the thumbnails for, um, those are there online. Um, so folks who have a question that might come up later today um, can reach out and connect with you there via your website and also email. So thank you. Thanks for joining us um, and, and sharing this presentation with us. We're going to transition now. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. We're going to transition now to another care story from the Global Voices of Caregiving Project, this time from Marcelo in Brazil. Marcelo is a husband and caregiver with a message to share about the importance of caregivers taking care themselves. Olá, como vão todos? Meu nome é Marcelo Lima, sou brasileiro e moro em Brasília, a capital do país. Sou cuidadora há mais de sete anos da Cláudia Lopes, minha esposa. Nas fotos, procuro mostrar que funciona muito bem 
a todo cuidador manter-se ativo, porque traz ganhos tanto para o corpo quanto para a alma. Mesmo que o papel de cuidador lhe mostre desafios diários, o que é muito comum, entendo que é preciso procurar alguma válvula de escape para suportar desgastes emocionais e da sua própria saúde. Fique atento, continue cuidando sem deixar de se cuidar. Para que isso melhore, cuidadores precisam conhecer os benefícios de atividades físicas para melhorar a qualidade de vida, reduzir o estresse e ter consciência corporal. Uma dica é a busca de atividades prazerosas e que tragam mudança na maneira de enxergar a perspectiva da vida daqui para frente, com mais esperança, mais otimismo e mais fé. Esse é o caminho. Na minha visão para um mundo que inclua e apoia os cuidadores, precisaríamos receber informações de qualidade acerca dos benefícios da prática de atividades físicas e o impacto dessa mudança de atitude na nossa autoestima, concentração e relacionamento com o paciente. Sou dedicado e feliz me cuidando e cuidando da minha esposa. Você tem se cuidado? Vamos, mexa-se! Thank you for your story, Marcelo. And I appreciate Marcelo's question. Are you taking care of yourself? And I hope that some of the sessions we've already shared and the ones to come will help provide some suggestions or spark ideas to do just that. If you're inspired to share your vision for a world that includes and supports caregivers, you can join the conversation on Twitter by sharing a photo that represents this for you. And tell us why using the hashtags WCC22 and World Cares. The next session is called Caregiver TLC, Implementation and Assessment of a Virtual Psychoeducational Intervention for Informal Caregivers of Older Adults with Chronic Illness in North Carolina, USA. As we bring a panel of experts on to share it with you, let me introduce each of them briefly. I wanna first welcome Dr. Anne Charayan Bilbrey. Dr. Bilbrey is the CEO of the Optimal Aging Center in Sunnyvale, California. She has focused her professional career in developing interventions for caregivers of individuals with chronic physical illness. Next, I welcome Angela Barrow. Angela has enjoyed a career in England, the Middle East, Florida, and North Carolina, and her practices have included long-term care and rehabilitation nursing, acute medical and midwifery practice, nurse tutoring, and currently dementia care education. Angela has valuable experience in the holistic and person-centered practices related to senior support services. I'm pleased to welcome next Dr. Dolores Gallagher-Thompson. Dr. Gallagher-Thompson is a research professor emerita and a board-certified geropsychologist in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University School of Medicine. She has devoted the past 25 years to research and clinical practice with family caregivers of persons with dementia and other chronic medical conditions. I'll welcome next Dr. Julian Montoro Rodriguez, who is a professor of sociology and former director of the gerontology program at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte and the PI for the Caregiver TLC project. During the past 15 years, he has collaborated with Dr. Dolores Gallagher Thompson on issues related to family caregiving and race and ethnicity differences across the life course. And finally, welcome Dr. Jennifer Ramsey. Dr. Jennifer Ramsey is a lecturer in the Department of Psychological Sciences at Case Western Reserve University and the project manager for the Caregiver TLC project. She has engaged in research collaborations focused on supporting the needs of informal caregivers, grandparents raising grandchildren, and older adults residing in low-income housing. Thank you all for being here to share your work. I'd like to now turn things over to Dr. Montoro Rodriguez to begin the session. Dr. Montoro Rodriguez, you're still on mute. I'm going to send you a mute re unmute request now.
Hello. Perfect. Thank you for joining us about on this session about the Caregiver TLC Virtual Psychoeducational Program to support family caregivers. We would like to acknowledge South Mister in Charlotte, North Carolina, for their financial support to implement the caregiver program and for their continued support for healthy aging initiatives in Charlotte. All presenters here have no actual or potential conflict of interest to declare in relation to this presentation. If you look at the information on the uh, people involved in the project, you can see that our research team is fully interdisciplinary. It includes colleagues from institutions in North Carolina, in Ohio, and also in California. So far, we have developed the main components of the caregiver program, such as the, web, the website platform, the training of facilitators to deliver the workshops, the dissemination and recruitment of caregivers. And we have established an advisory board representing community organizations interested in offering the program to their members. Mm -hmm. The advisory board is chaired by Tracy McGuinness, the director of philanthropy at the South Mister Community Fund. Tracy has given the project tremendous support, visibility, and she is our champion. So I invite you all to learn today about the program and send any questions you may have to ask. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Julian. Uh, could we advance the slides, uh, Lauren, Rachel? Yes, thank you. Keep going. One more. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to start us off by uh, providing some context on the Caregiver TLC program. Uh, there's been a tremendous increase in caregiver-related research, particularly intervention research, in the past decade. Uh, it has been in general, but also focusing on psychoeducational programs in particular. Uh, there are a couple of well-maintained and up-to-date websites that uh, give you a lot of information about evidence-based programs for dementia caregivers. And I think uh, Jennifer is going to put information in the chat. Yeah, thank you. Um, these, the websites... Uh, of course, while they focus on dementia caregiving, a lot of the information can be used with persons with other chronic illnesses as well. Uh, they they uh, describe evidence-based programs under the heading of best practice caregiving. So the key features of each program is described along with what's necessary for training and implementation, as well as contact information. And many of these programs have used technology in a variety of forms, sometimes the whole program is delivered through technology, other times a component of it. And clearly that has a lot of benefit. It enables caregivers who are not able to get out and attend something in person uh, to gain the information, the knowledge, the skills, the support that they, that they need. And it can reduce social isolation because at least in some formats, uh, information is gonna be shared among participants. Um, the next slide. The next slide shows the extensive use of technology to implement psychoeducational programs throughout the world. Um, by far, the most popular are programs derived from iSupport. iSupport was developed by the World Health Organization in collaboration with several academic partners about eight years ago. It was one of the first programs to be totally online from registration through to completion. It emphasized self paced learning with a variety of instructional modules that you could choose from depending on your situation. There are generic versions in Spanish and English now available through the World Health Organization. And again, the website is on the slide, but it's also going to be in the chat. Um, and it has been culturally adapted and now is ongoing in 36 different countries and in 31 languages. Now, if we look at the slide quickly, go from left to right, we can see that the Telesavvy Caregiver Program, which was derived from Savvy Caregiving, 
that many of you may already be familiar with, is being implemented both in the US and Canada. I support, I mentioned 36 countries, some of them include Brazil, Switzerland, Vietnam, Australia, and then another program called Understaid, which is similar, it's psychoeducational in nature, is being uh, used in Poland, Denmark, and Spain. So for these programs to be successful, they have had to be culturally tailored and adapted to the needs of that particular country. For example, in India, where the pilot study was done, we found that content that encouraged use of standard relaxation techniques like guided imagery and visualization needed to be replaced with content that was more culturally relevant. And in this instance, it was material on meditation and yoga because those were the principal methods of relaxation used in that, in that country. Now, if we look at the next slide, we see who are the caregivers. Uh, this, is a, this is data taken from a report published by NAC and the AARP in 2020. And we find that at that time in the United States, there were about 30, 53 million unpaid caregivers. About 60% of them are women, 25% care for more than one person, and um, almost half care for persons with more than one chronic medical illness. Uh, in the US, these caregivers are vital to uh, the functioning of our healthcare system because it is very fractionated and it depends more on the family than, it, than government supported programs. Uh, but as you see, there are costs and benefits involved to being a caregiver. So some of the benefits, especially if the caregiver is included in making care decisions, is that it may improve the quality of life of their care recipient. Why? Because they will get access to more services. It can delay or in some instances prevent institutionalization if the caregiver is actively involved in problem solving. And it can lower costs by reducing hospital readmissions, for example. Uh, but these benefits do come at some cost to the caregiver. <clears throat> So if we look at that data, we see that many, about one fourth report poor to fair health of their own, so that their own health was impacted negatively by caregiving. And somewhere between a third and a half report psychological distress, uh, problems with depression, anxiety, guilt, and other kinds of negative emotions. <clears throat> Could I have the next slide, please? Um, so, what is the TLC program and how does it fit in this broader context? Well, the, TL, the Caregiver TLC program is a program that was designed to address some of those concerns. So by using technology, we're trying to reach more isolated caregivers. By doing a skill building psychoeducational approach, we're in, encouraging the development of resilience uh, so that caregivers feel more empowered uh, to take care of their situations. <clears throat> and we have a further goal of improving management of the care recipient. Uh, and how do we do that? Well, we have three components to the program. Um, and uh, Dr. Bilbrey will be describing that in more detail uh, in her section. Uh, but right now, we'll just say that there are six weekly workshop sessions. They're 90 minutes each. Um, they generally have six to eight participants. Uh, why? Because these workshops are interactive. They're not just talking heads. We want the caregivers to share their experiences and interact with one another, as well as with the facilitators. <clears throat> uh, second, we have uh, developed an extensive set of resources that include um, videos and other workshop materials uh, that, that have been curated and are up on our website. Uh, I think the website information is already in the chat, so thank you for that. Uh, and we also have developed a monthly webinar series uh, to foster the building of virtual communities, a virtual community of caregivers. That does not exist at the current time in this region of the United States. Uh, the next slide. <clears throat> Caregiver TLC uses technology in a variety of ways right from the beginning. So online surveys are used for registration, obtaining informed consent, 
Remember, we said this started as a research, as a funded research project. <clears throat> And also uh, repeated assessments are, are administered in order to determine progress and gain feedback from the caregivers. Uh, both the workshop and the webinars use a HIPAA compliant Zoom platform that's sponsored by the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And access to the program is through a variety of uh, forms of technology, for example, <clears throat> a laptop computer, a desktop computer, or a smartphone, they all enable the person uh, to, to log in so that different communication preferences can be honored. And clearly there are many benefits to doing a program in this way. Um, there's no travel time for the caregiver. Hopefully they just go from one room to another. Um, it's less exposure to possible health risks, which is very important as we continue to see a resurgence in COVID cases and other types of illnesses that caregivers can be exposed to if they're in a meeting in person with others. Um, it's certainly a safe way for them to get information, knowledge, and support. They can join from any location that they choose, and they may be more comfortable sharing personal information because there's greater anonymity possible. They could use their nickname on the screen. They don't have to uh, they can hide their face if they wish, uh, though we encourage them not to do that. But some people have reported that they feel better sharing this way than in person. But there are also barriers. A huge one is this digital divide. That is very real in the United States <clears throat> due to many factors. Uh, a key one is, of course, is economic. There are many people who simply don't have the funds to purchase the equipment or purchase the needed internet service. Um, in some areas of, the, of our country, there's a lack of reliable internet connectivity. It just doesn't exist, or there's not enough bandwidth to be able to access all the components of the program, all the features of the program. Uh, secondly, there can be embarrassment about one's background, about the setting in which the person is joining the Zoom platform. Third, there can be interruptions, and there often are distractions from the care recipient, noises, other kinds of things going on in the environment that make it hard for the caregiver to concentrate. And finally, many caregivers, especially the older ones, who, those who are older themselves, have difficulty seeing or hearing over Zoom. And they may, not, they may want to have a hard copy of the materials, but might not have a printer available. So there, there are some challenges to doing online programming. Um, the next slide. Nevertheless, the, this program is being successfully implemented in the Piedmont region of North Carolina, and it is benefiting many families in this region. It represents a true community university collaboration. And it was launched in the early stages of the COVID pandemic when most resources for caregivers were shut down and they had very little opportunity to participate in anything that was going to be helpful. So I think that maybe gave us a little bit of a boost in terms of, uh, avail of our accessibility. And the program would not have been possible without the vision of Mr. Ben Gilchrist, who's the CEO of Southminster. He saw this as an investment into foster community-based solutions for caregiving challenges. And clearly, I think that, that is what we're doing. We are fulfilling this mission. Now, if we look at the next slide, uh, in summary, uh, the aims of the research <clears throat> have been the, the following as listed there, to offer online psychoeducational evidence-based program to a diverse group of caregivers, educationally diverse, uh, socioeconomically diverse uh, race and ethnicity, uh, to foster resilience. And we do that uh, by the skill training approach and also by the, the easy access to the resources and partnerships with community-based organizations are vital to the success of the program. The ultimate goal is to embed Caregiver TLC into these community-based organizations so that the program is accessible, sustainable, and available over time. And uh, now I'm gonna turn, turn the presentation over to Dr. Bilbrey, who's gonna give us the nuts and bolts. 
Hello, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Gallagher Thompson. Today, I'm going to be speaking about the intervention itself and how we successfully have been able to keep the fidelity portion of our intervention from the first session to the last. Next slide, please. Caregiver Thrive Learning Connect, or Caregiver TLC, contains a six-week workshop access to supporting materials on our website and an ongoing monthly meeting called Continuing Conversations. Website contains session summaries, a downloadable support materials such as the participant guide, a PDF of slide sets, session handouts, resources sorted by session topic, and should they miss a session, make up videos that the participant can then view and ask questions of their facilitator. If they wish, they can also view the webinar portion of the continuing conversations. Continuing conversations is a 90 minute meeting covering various topics. The first 45 minutes is recorded and presents information in a webinar format. In the second 45 minutes, the recording is stopped and the meeting becomes much more interactive and seeks to actively engage the attendees. Depending on the topic and the presenter, there may be discussions and or activities that help the caregiver to integrate the material that they just heard. Next slide, please. The Caregiver TLC workshop is presented in six 90-minute sessions over Zoom. All of the sessions share certain components, such as starting with a deep breath. Um, then we move on to check in on the previous week's material. We then review the session's agenda, followed by unique weekly session content, reviewing the takeaway points, and then the creation of an action plan. The six weekly sessions are first strategies for stress. Um, this session talks about chronic stress and teaches two stress management techniques, deep breathing and guided imagery or visualization. The second session is dealing with the blues. We offer information regarding depressive symptoms and teach caregivers how to use behavioral activation or positive activities to manage their mood. The third session is bouncing back and the topic under discussion is resilience. Two skills are shared here. The first uses a positive psychology foundation to teach caregivers how to retrain their brain to notice the positive things around them. We also use the Antlers Care Map to help caregivers to visualize their own unique care networks. The fourth session is filling the well and the topic is self-care. Skills taught include identifying different categories of self-care and focusing on the small ways they can add self-care. We talk about sleep hygiene, also discuss some of the cognitive barriers they may run into as they try to increase the amount of self-care in their day. The fifth session is coping with frustration and the topic is anger management. Skills are taught how to identify and use physical clues as well as their thoughts to identify where they are in a calm to furious emotional continuum and use that information to select from a variety of anger management techniques to manage their response. Finally, our sixth session is divided into two parts. The first half covers how to maintain social connectedness through various online methods when face-to-face -face meetings are either too difficult or perhaps um, countermanded uh, because of the disease. The second half reviews the skills learned over the previous six weeks and the caregivers create a master plan to continue to integrate and use these skills going forward. Next slide, please. I'd like to take a brief moment to talk about how we help the caregivers to integrate these new skills that are being taught. The action plan is based on SMART goals and helps the caregiver to make a plan to practice the new skill during the week. They are encouraged to write down the plan, create reminders, identify possible barriers, and proactively think of solutions. Our check-in is done at the start of the next session 
and is an interactive discussion with heavy participant engagement. The focus is on what was learned from the experience. Did it work? Were modifications needed? Um, caregivers also share the creative ways they manage any barriers they may have run into. This is peers helping peers. Next slide, please. Caregiver TLC is a derivative of the 1996 REACH Coping with Caregiving program. Each version since the original has incorporated lessons learned, new research as it has become available, as well as integrating caregiver feedback. Next slide. Our Fidelity Plan has four parts. The design of the workshop itself, the facilitator training, observation of the workshop sessions, and the weekly facilitator meetings. Next slide. Regarding the design of the workshop, the workshop is manualized and each facilitator receives a script to follow along with a session by session PowerPoint that guides the delivery of important information and the skill and the teaching of the skills. Next slide. All training is done virtually over Zoom. We currently have completed two facilitator trainings and are in the process of a third training. The training covers the psychoeducational content, as well as the differences between a support group and a psychoeducational group, since many of our community facilitators are more familiar with the running of support groups. We also cover how to facilitate engagement and group participation, since the workshop is very interactive and requires participant involvement. We discuss with the facilitators the importance of fidelity in research and inform them of the process so there's no misunderstandings as they start their, their own workshops. During the training period, facilitators are learning virtually. Each training cohort receives six two-hour training sessions. They are also required to observe pre-recorded workshop sessions in between each training session to get a basic introduction to the material and to observe the flow of the presentation. The facilitators all have online access to content materials, including the PowerPoints, the facilitator guide, uh, all of the handouts, along with access to all of the materials that are available to the participant in case there are any questions. Uh, next slide. As part of the observation phase, we observe the videos of the sessions and score them using a fidelity checklist. The first time a facilitator offers a workshop, we observe all six sessions. Each additional time they run a workshop, a random session is observed and scored. Next slide. Facilitators with active workshops meet weekly. Um, they get questions answered about past or upcoming sessions. If there were any issues or concern raised during the last session, we discuss what the issue was and how they handled it. During this process, the trainer has an opportunity to note if there was any drift from the intervention intent. We also gather facilitator observations regarding content, um, their perception of the caregiver's reaction to the content, overall engagement, with the material and any other comments the facilitator wishes to make. At this point, I'm going to hand you off to Dr. Ramsey to discuss the methodology of the study. Thank you, Dr. Bilbray. Next slide, please. In regard to the study's guiding framework and theory, the predictors and outcomes assessed are based on an adaptation of the preventive and corrective proactivity or PCP model. Specifically, we examine effects of demographic variables such as age, sex, and race on stressors, including ADLs and IADLs, burden, and stress. Additionally, these stressors may both impact and be affected by the caregiver TLC program skills that Dr. Bilbray discussed earlier. And of course, the stressors will affect outcomes of interest, including anxiety, depression, and nursing home placement. We also wanted to account for and examine effects of internal and external resources, such as the caregiver's financial resources, social support, coping strategies, 
self-efficacy, and of course, potential gains. The resources may also have an effect on outcomes and may both affect and be affected by program skills, as you can see in the model. Next slide, please. In regard to methodology, we actively collaborate with local organizations, as Dr. Gallagher Thompson mentioned previously. And these organizations serve a diverse population of caregivers to disseminate recruitment materials among their members. We also advertise with local media outlets with a large middle-aged and older adult following, as well as a diverse following, including Axio Charlotte and Queen City Metro. Recruitment materials include a link to our registration website, which again is available in the chat, where potential participants answer a brief survey regarding the type of care they provide, the number of hours per week they provide care, and of course their preferred availability to participate in the Caregiver TLC workshop. Members of the research team review the survey responses and caregivers providing at least four hours of care per week are sent an email with a link to the consent form. Again, this is all done virtually and are contacted to complete the technology survey. Caregivers requesting technology assistance are contacted and provided with training in how to use the Zoom platform. Qualifying caregivers are contacted when a group is scheduled that closely matches their availability. And once availability is confirmed, participants are randomly assigned to either the experimental or waiting list control conditions. Participants in the experimental group are contacted via phone to complete the time one or pre-assessment, and the waitlist control group completes the time zero assessment concurrently so that the groups can be compared and assessed for any differences. Approximately one week prior to the experimental group completing the caregiver TLC workshop that Dr. Bilbrey discussed, the waitlist control group is contacted to complete the time one pre-assessment. Thus, changes in outcome measures from time zero to time one in the control group and from time one to time two in the experimental group can be compared. Once the experimental group completes the six week workshop, they are contacted to complete the time two or post assessment and the waitlist control group begins the workshop. And then upon completing the six week workshop, the waitlist control group also completes the time two assessment. And this means that the experimental groups and waitlist control groups pre workshop and post workshop scores can be used to assess program efficacy. And both groups are also contacted to complete the time three or follow-up assessment approximately two months after completing the workshop. And as discussed, all registrants, whether qualifying to participate in the Caregiver TLC program or not, are sent invitations to the monthly continuing conversations webinars. Again, the purpose of these webinars is to provide sustained and ongoing support to caregivers build a virtual community among caregivers, and connect caregivers to local organizations and professionals. Next slide, please. As previously mentioned, we attempted to account for any digital divide issues by offering technology training to caregivers upon request. However, keep in mind caregivers in this sample must already have internet access and an email address to register for the program. Thus, caregivers in our sample possess at least a basic knowledge and familiarity with technology. As such, most of the sample uses computers daily, and only 2.2% have requested and received technology support. Again, familiarity and comfort using technology is likely due to selection effects specific to our sample, and we encourage others to remain mindful of potential issues regarding access to and use of technology with other samples of caregivers. Next slide, please. Regarding our results, keep in mind data collection is ongoing. Our goal is to collect pre and post data on 100 caregivers, and we plan to continue offering the caregiver TLC program and collecting data until the fall of 2023 in efforts to meet this goal. 
To date, 135 caregivers have completed the registration survey and of those 128 are eligible to participate. Of these eligible caregivers, 20 withdrew before randomization, 48 remain on the wait list to be contacted when a group matching their availability is scheduled, and 60 have been assigned to participate in the workshop, with 28 assigned to the experimental group and 30 assigned to the wait list control group. Of those assigned, 14 have withdrawn after baseline and one before baseline, for a total of 17 in the experimental group and 17 in the waitlist control group with pre and post data. Next slide, please. And now Angela Burrow, one of the caregiver TLC facilitators will discuss participant engagement. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey. Many family caregiver participants join the caregiver TLC sessions to explore how they can acquire some coping skills to deal with stress, depression at times, and the burdens that come with caregiving. As a facilitator, I have a direct line to those who could benefit from the program, and I am able to raise awareness through my work with local senior centers, our local counties council on aging, and in my role coaching frontline care staff. The program is attractive and useful to many as they become more encouraged due to the virtual format with accompanying technical support if needed. As a dementia specialist, I value the quality of the content of this session. It is a really good resource for practitioners like me. Family caregivers have voiced that many of their needs are met beyond the benefits of the usual support groups with this program. Prompt emails and informative websites allow caregivers to identify their need and therefore easily commit to the sessions. Next slide, please. Thank you. And go back. Slide two. Thank you. The caregiver participants are encouraged to give feedback after the sessions. I will share some with you today. One caregiver comments that she frequently uses the breathing and visualization exercises that she learned, and they'd help to relieve stress. Another says the sessions allowed me to validate my feelings and actions during my journey with my mother. The series has brought more clarity to information that I already knew and allows me to look at it in different terms as I listen to the content and the other caregiver participants. Another says, I appreciate the personal interaction and I was able to ask questions or make comments without feeling judged. Just being heard by someone makes a world of difference. Another shares, I trusted the facilitator who through her wealth of experience understood. And another says, this program is valuable. The facilitator has been gracious with answers and insight, as well as answering emails promptly after the sessions. Next slide, please. Many caregivers have voiced their appreciation and growing confidence that they were not alone and the relationship with the program and its facilitators was ongoing. It's important to note that the caregivers were given opportunities to ask for specific topics and guidance in the continuing conversation sessions. This in addition to the strategies and resource guide, which is theirs to keep outside of the caregiver sessions. Also, the makeup session stored on the caregiver TLC website maintain the flow for those caregivers who missed a session for whatever reason. Next slide. Very early on, participants showed appreciation for the ongoing program called Continuing Conversations with the opportunity for the 45 minutes of webinar and an invitation to linger for questions and answers afterwards. A variety of topics are offered with speakers, including local healthcare specialists, educators, gerontologists, and area agents on aging representatives. As Dr. Bilby mentions, recordings are stored on the TLC website for future reference. On your screen, some are listed, some recent offerings. 
Sharing positive activities, for example, allows participants to share stories and ideas. Communication strategies for avoiding family conflict brings fresh ideas to the table. Empowering caregivers with a voice encourages caregivers to advocate with confidence. Forget what's lost, focus on what remains, provides hope and positivity to those living with dementia. Caregiver resources and supports is led by a representative from our local area agency on aging, bringing information that at times is brand new to the caregiver. I have observed camaraderie amongst the family caregivers. Often when they shared experiences and strategies, the facilitator could step aside for a few moments as they heard each other's stories. The takeaway would often be the caregiver's hope and gratitude and enthusiasm to try some new strategy that they had never thought of before. There would be eagerness to share each other's successes, for example, with the newly learned coping strategies, for example, deep breathing, anger management, or redirection. Several caregivers appreciate how the program gives them direction and confidence to organize themselves. For example, the tool known as the Atlas Care Map has resonated with many who leave the session saying, we are going to take a fresh look and add people to our circle of support. One caregiver explained that she has no one to share her deepest thoughts with, so this program feels like a safe haven. In turn, it might encourage her to reach out to more organizations, for example, the local chapter of the Alzheimer's Association with its helplines. Here's my final thought for you as a facilitator. One caregiver shared that she has been able to let go of feeling guilty as she has listened to the frustrations of others in the program. So I hope you can see the immense value for each and every participant. And with that, I'll hand back to Dr. Dolores Gallagher-Thompson. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Angela. Uh, yeah, may I have the next slide, please? So uh, future directions, put the next one, please. Next slide, yeah. So uh, I hope that, I trust that you now understand and can sort of appreciate the depth and, depth and breadth of the Caregiver TLC program. Uh, and you might be asking yourself this question, you know, well, where are they going with this now? Because uh, it seems like a you know, pretty good program. It's well received. We're having some good impact on caregivers. So we have uh, what we want to do, our ultimate goal is to embed the program into community-based organization. That's our ultimate goal, so that it is sustainable and the community-based organization can give, do the program without us. So we can withdraw when the research funding is over, and, uh, they, but they will still have the program and then be able to use it uh, when we step away. So we're creating, we are creating master trainers from these community-based programs, as you heard uh, Dr. Bilbrey describe, uh, the master trainers are well-trained so that by the time they uh, complete the training and they're doing the facilitation on their own, uh, we are confident that they are doing the program as it was designed. And I think Angela Burrow is an excellent example of that, of someone who um, came in with an open mind, uh, had a great deal of training and experience already uh, working with caregivers, but wanted to learn a, a newer, a different approach and uh, really dove right in and has been one of our, our strongest facilitators uh, since then. Uh, and such a person is a champion then within their agency because the agency has to resolve practical issues. There are issues of how they're going to dispense their resources, uh, the time involved in this program, you know, there is some front end time in order for the training to be completed and the facilitator to get up and running. Um, and maybe a longer program than some agencies are accustomed to giving. Uh, it, and some may not be using technology all that much yet. And so using technology to the extent that this program does might re represent kind of a switch for them as well. 
So the administration uh, has to be on board with it in order to resolve the practical programs so that the practical issues so that the program can really um, be included in their repertoire of services, uh, that it is not just seen as an add on, but it's actually part of an integral part. And as you, we've been saying, we're trying to create this virtual community. And we think Charlotte, North Carolina is a good place to do it uh, because Charlotte has so many um, agencies that are focused on caregiving, caring for elders of different, different types of problems. Uh, there's a great deal of energy in the community. It's a dementia friendly community. So there's a lot going for it. And we're hoping that uh, the various agencies, some of the ones we have partnerships with already, and then others that Dr. William Montero Rodriguez will develop in the future, uh, will uh, take over the continuing conversation piece of it so that this will be owned by the community. This will be something that they, uh, they offer on a regular basis, and hopefully it will lead to further service development. You know, ideas will come out that uh, this or that service is lacking or it, access is difficult, or, you know, we don't have, uh, we, well, there's a gap here. For example, there's a real gap in dealing, uh, in uh, providing training and education and support to teenagers who are dealing, who are providing care to an older relative or participating in some way in the caregiving experience. And more and more of them are doing that. Uh, there are very few resources so that may be an, an unmet need that would come to light uh, as the community continues to be engaged. Um, the next slide, please. So, um, yeah, so what are some things that we've learned, okay, and that we might, uh, you know, do a little differently or modify, continue to improve as we go along? Um, I would say the first has been to directly address this digital divide issue so that we could engage caregivers with limited resources, limited and or limited experience. Um, and it, it so happens that the Institute for Local Self-Reliance in conjunction with AARP literally just published a, a series of PDFs called Exploring Digital Equity. Um, and it includes topics like uh, what kinds of skills does a caregiver really need? What are the key digital skills that are needed? So it doesn't have to be fancy, what are the basic ones? And how do you train caregivers and other individuals, but how do you do the training? What do we mean by bandwidth? And how do you know if you have enough bandwidth for a particular program? Things like that, very, very practical, downloadable from the URL uh, and no, um, uh, no cost, of course, involved. Uh, the second thing that I think we learned and hope to build on is the importance of community-based participatory research design. And um, there's a whole literature on that, but in, it, just in brief, it means bringing key stakeholders to the table right from the outset. And we have made great attempts to do that, and we have done it to, to a large extent through the advisory board uh, and the involvement of, this, of a number of community stakeholders as we've been describing, but there are also some that were not included in uh, that I think we're learning are key to the success and sustainability of the program over time. So uh, in the future iterations, we would want to have them at the table from the very outset so that they can give input into design and implementation issues, help with some of the practical problems that are confronted. Uh, and again, this sense of ownership uh, we think will foster a more effective recruitment and retention, particularly of these difficult to reach populations. And uh, the next slide is my, my last slide. Um, I sincerely hope we have added to your knowledge base about the importance of caring for the caregiver and have shown you that it can be done effectively at a relatively low cost and through the creative use of technology using our program as a specific example, but I mentioned others that exist as well that you might be interested in looking into. Now, we believe that with continued new developments in technology, in the equipment, in the platforms, in accessibility, and other aspects, psychoeducational programs can be made available to the real unsung heroes of long-term care, and that's the family caregivers.
So thank you. And I believe now Laura and Rachel is going to moderate if there are questions or discussions. Uh, since we have a little bit of time, we ended a little early and uh, we did that deliberately to have time for discussion. Fantastic. And thank you all for this presentation that you just shared with us. Um, I'm going to invite the audience now to share questions through that Q&A area for our presenters so that they can answer some of these live with you. Now, Dr. Bilbrey and Dr. Gallagher-Thompson, you've been answering some questions in that Q&A, and there's one that came up a lot that I want to just ask you to share um, now, even though I know you've answered it, and that is um, there's a lot of interest in participating in this program. Caregivers have been in the chat and Q&A asking, can I be a part of this? Um, so how, how can people be a part of this? Well, let me just start off uh, by saying that the program is not limited to North Carolina. Uh, it is at this moment in time because it is still, a, it is a research program and the research is ongoing. It is not yet completed as Dr. Ramsey explained. So uh, we, you know, it is an, uh, not available beyond North Carolina at this moment, but it certainly will be because that, that is our, our hope. Um, and then training, uh, there were several questions and uh, Dr. Bilber, you want to address some of the training issues that came up in the chat or in the q and I think there were people from other areas who were interested in be becoming facilitators and they wondered how that might happen. Um, I think she might have froze, frozen. Um, Anne, are you there? Yes, I am. Oh, okay. um, Sorry, right I'm now, sorry. I am directing all um, people who are interested in facilitating to Dr. Ramsey, and she will she will check and verify where they live and if it's appropriate, and um, then she'll get back in contact with them. So if you reach out, I believe her her email is currently um, in the chat. So feel free to reach out and you can ask any questions about the becoming a facilitator um, through that. Perfect, yeah. thank you. But again, since our program is totally online um, and the facilitator training is as well, uh, that, that too should be able to be available to people in different parts of the country. Uh, we've trained, Dr. Bilbrey has trained people in Florida, We've trained people in Southern California. So we have other programs besides the Caregiver TLC program um, that we do remote training in. So that is worth exploring. And we appreciate the interest of people uh, in the audience uh, in our program. And we hope that you will contact us so that we could explore this further. And I think there was another question that looked uh, that was in the Q&A about 90 minutes versus 60 minutes. And the individual said, I'm frankly surprised carers found this satisfactory and not too long. Could you please comment? Anybody wanna comment on that? Actually, Angela, I think you're the perfect person to chime in on this mm -hmm. since you're kind of the boots on the ground. Yeah, I was just thinking that I've, I've experienced it. So people can step away. And also that there are makeup sessions and the wonderful Dr. Bilbury um, has all those stored on the TL site, TLC site and they can make up time so they can step aside. Um, but they actually make time. And what one participant said to me was that we're not traveling, we're not having to get ready. We're just getting ready for the Zoom. So the zero travel time. So they managed to do it. I think once or twice, um, they didn't show up. And what was great was that they would email or call and then join a makeup session. So I did not see in the six week program a couple of times I did it that there was an issue there. Um, it's they're invested and they do make relationships with each other. It's very interesting that camaraderie is noticed from the very first session. Thanks for sharing that. And we got a comment related to that from Venitra um, that's about the break, um, that she appreciates that, that break in between at the 45 minute mark. Um, 
taking a quick look at the Q&A because I do see additional questions coming up. Um, still getting questions about how to get in touch with you all. So if you're listening and you're interested in more information on this, um, Jennifer, Dr. Ramsey has shared how to get in touch um, with the folks on the panel. Um, so look to the chat for that information. Um, she has dropped emails there as well as the website home um, where there's more information on this program um, and as well as some links to be in contact. There was, there was a comment from someone in the San Diego, California area. Uh, and there is already an, there is an agency in San Diego, California that is using a, um, a program similar to this one, and uh, be happy to put that individual in touch with the person in Cal in San Diego. If they would email me after this, I'd be glad to put them in contact. I would say that the the best way to contact us is through the website, the caregiver TLC or dot org, because you you have information about the program, about about the uh, the research team the content of the workshops, you have the emails, uh, you can register if you want to, you have information about the continuing uh, conversations, webinars that we do every month. So that's like a one place for everything and that will be easier. Perfect. And thanks for sharing that. I've just, um, the website is that very last link that was just shared um, into the chat. So please go ahead and click that, pick up that link there um, so that you have that if you are interested in more information. So at this time, um, I don't see any additional questions in the Q&A and we have your contact information. If questions come up for folks a little later, they know how to find more information. Um, so I wanna thank you for being here with us and being live so that we could ask you some questions. Um, we appreciate your presentation. Thank you all. Thank you. I mean, we really appreciate being invited. Thank you so much. And now we'd love to transition to back to our Global Voices of Caregiving project um, to the next care story that we have to share. Um, this time from Mary Leia in Brazil. Mary Leia will share her story and her vision for a caregiver friendly world. Olá, sou Marileia Pinheiro da cidade de São Paulo, Brasil. Sabe que eu cuidei de três familiares? Hum. Primeiro foi meu filho, que na época tinha 11 anos, hoje com 37. Na época, criei um método para enfrentar a situação, que chamei de OPA. Oração, paciência, amor e humor. Oração porque essa nos conecta ao Criador. Paciência para encarar a situação. Amor fundamental, ao meu ver, para quem está sendo cuidado. E humor, onde o paciente precisa saber que a vida é bela e devemos lutar por ela. Isso fez toda a diferença. Como manter o opa ativo? Além do apoio espiritual, independente de qualquer religião, uma ajuda profissional, como a psicoterapia e também a solidariedade de pessoas próximas, faz toda a diferença. Minha visão para um mundo mais acolhedor para o cuidador é ter o OPA em conjunto com os profissionais. Thank you, Mary, Leia. We are approaching the final session in our focus on integrating caregivers to the care team. And we've already heard from three different nations around three different programs that have envisioned how to do this with the caregivers they collaborate with. But now we're gonna end this conversation with a look at outcomes for carers and how to appropriately and effectively reflect carers' outcomes in um, helping work with patients and carers. Emma Miller is going to lead us in this conversation with her session, Outcomes for Carers. 
Emma is a senior research fellow at the University of Strathclyde in Scotland. She has a background in social work practice. Since completing her PhD, she has worked between research, policy, and practice on the theme of personal outcomes, applying knowledge exchange and action research to embed an outcomes approach to practice. We welcome Emma, um, and as soon as you're ready, Emma, you can take it away. Thanks very much, Lauren, and um, thanks so much for including me in the program today. It's great to be part of um, such a global event and to hear voices from so many different countries. And um, I'm reflecting back particularly on early this morning when we heard the first global voices of caregiving and um, just the importance of carer stories, I guess, being at the centre of so much of the work that we're describing today. Um, and also fascinated to hear the role of chief story officer, which um, is a, a role I haven't heard before. But I guess all of that stuff around stories kind of links into what I'm about to describe in the work we've done around personal outcomes for carers in Scotland, because I guess underpinning this work over many years is an understanding that oftentimes carers don't, aren't able to, to tell their story when they come into contact with support and services for the first time. And that actually they may be in a state of crisis and may not, as we've heard several times today, even recognise that they are a carer. Um, and therefore, how carers are engaged with and how they are supported to reflect on their situation and to think about what matters to them in the context of their caring situation is really at the heart of what I'm about to describe now. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. And I guess when we think about focusing on outcomes for carers, the, the outcomes that matter to carers, that can be a bit of a shift. One of my previous roles in life was as a social worker working in Scotland for nearly 10 years. And I always thought of myself as being very person centered. But when I started doing research and outcomes, I realized that I had a tendency to try to work with carers and people uh, supported by services to try and work out where they fitted into the system, where they fitted in service land, rather than really being able to take a step back and hear what was really important to them in their life as a whole. And so we have this diagram that we've used for years, which kind of illustrates that shift. So we think about inputs as being the things and services that support um, carers. So things like staff, for example, or training programs, they are the kind of ingredients and processes. I'm thinking here in carer support organizations, things like um, support planning with carers or assessment, et cetera and how important it is to get those processes right if you don't want your cake to fail. Um, and then often we're, we're heading towards the cake, but I guess with the, or the service, but I guess with outcomes, what we're doing is shifting that focus to really engage with that carer to work out what is it that's important to them in their lives. And some practitioners we've worked with speak about carer outcomes as being working backwards. So where is it you want to get to? And how do we work together to get there? So next slide, please. So if we think just for a moment about what we mean by carer outcomes, and this, this work is based on years and years of research, initially at York University, and then work we did at Glasgow University um, about 16 years ago. But three key categories of outcomes we're talking about here. Uh, one of them is about managing the caring role, and we've heard about lots of great interventions today that are designed to support carers to manage their role, and they would be around things like um, a feeling informed, a feeling skilled and equipped for the caring role, for example. The process outcomes are really about how carers are engaged with <clears throat> by services and supports, and actually they're fundamental to carer uh, well-being. So feeling that you have been listened to, that you have a say in what happens, um, and that you are valued and respected by services can often be as important, if not more important than anything else that happens, any other supports and services. Um, and I think we've heard examples today of carers feeling valued being of fundamentally important as well. So there are the process outcomes, and then there's the quality of life of the carer I guess by which we mean the things that are important to all of us in our life. So having meaningful activity, being socially connected, um, feeling safe, for example. 
In the original research on outcomes for carers, the quality of life for the carer, the cared for person, was also a fourth theme. And it's not, we're not suggesting that that's not important. Of course it is. It's fundamentally important to carers to know that the person they care for is being properly cared for. But we have found that it takes a bit of support sometimes to shift the focus onto carer quality of life. So we've slightly de-emphasized that. So if we move on to the next slide, all of this work is underpinned by the exchange model of assessment. Again, something that's been around for years, 1990s actually, Smale and Tucson, but we find this a really powerful motif in working with uh, practitioners in health services, social care services, carer centres. Um, and what it signals is that when you're trying to identify outcomes with carers, you're recognising the expertise and knowledge of everybody who contributes to a conversation. So there is quite often a need to consider what's important to the cared for person, um, as well as what's important to relatives or carers. There's also the practitioner perspectives, and sometimes that might be multi multidisciplinary um, practitioners. And then there's an organisational perspective as well, which is kind of understanding that duty of care issues and so on. So really what we're talking about is bringing those perspectives together, knowledge, wisdom and expertise and blending them in order to negotiate and agree the outcomes that we're working towards. So oh, one more thing to say about the exchange model that's fundamental to the model we've developed in Scotland, that it's it's also strengths based. So it's based on an understanding that everyone brings skills and knowledge and that actually we need to build on people's strengths, not ignore them. And sometimes in services, there can be a tendency, I know myself, I've done it in the past, is to fo really focus on the deficits and the problems only and what we're going to do to fix those deficits and problems. So, so this is a shift again in emphasis. So next slide, please. So just a couple of reflections uh, on the carer outcomes. Um, I guess the one of the key things is about avoiding assumptions. So rather than approaching a carer conversation, um, assuming that we know what the challenges are because the cared for person has dementia, for example, we are putting aside assumptions to find out what is it for this individual carer in the context of their life, which is important to them. So it does mean having to put those assumptions aside. And I've already said about um, it's a shift from matching deficits to, to, um, to services to engaging with a carer about their life. And actually, we found that that can be one of the most challenging things to do, because I think we all uh, want to help. We're in the jobs that we do because we want to make things better. And so we feel a compulsion to try and fix things. But actually, sometimes just taking that step back can be the more helpful thing to do until we're clear about what's going on. Um, I guess I should also say that as well as the carer outcomes, we have a set of outcomes for people who are supported by services. And with the outcomes approach that I'm describing, there are real opportunities to look at, well, what are the outcomes for the supported person? Um, what are the outcomes for the carer? And how do we balance and navigate through those in the, in the context of an individual family, for example? And there's, we've also done lots of work. So although I'm talking today mainly about the conversation, we've done a lot of uh, work as well on how you write carer outcomes down under these key categories. And um, then how can you collate those outcomes within the context of a team or a support service to say what's going well, what's going less well, and what might we do to change things to, to deliver better carer outcomes. But working this way, evaluation can flow with practice rather than cutting against it. Um, and just to kind of acknowledge the context in Scotland that we do have a strong focus on carer outcomes and policy, including in the Carer Scotland Act. And that is helpful, I have to say. So next slide, please. So what are the key elements of an outcome focused conversation with carers? Um, We've just done some work recently revisiting this because we had a sense that we hadn't really articulated that well. What, what is it that we mean when we talk about an outcome focused conversation? Um, and so we worked with multidisciplinary practitioners through a few workshops through the last few months. And these were the principles that all practitioners signed up to. So first of all, it's about starting where the person or the family is. 
It's about focusing on what matters to them, including what they're hoping for. It is strengths-based, as I've said, so avoiding fixing people and building on what's already working. It's based on an exchange, so blending those different perspectives together. It's collaborative and based on partnership and thinking about carers as being key partners in working with services. It's about listening, having it, but that sometimes that can be a challenge uh, for practitioners. There's often a concern about having the time to listen, but even where there are small amounts of time, it's about defining that at the start and saying we don't have a lot of time today, but you know, within the time that you've got, what, what's important to you discuss, and maybe there's an opportunity to continue that conversation later or with someone else. This is also about considering wider resources in the community, not just formal services and linking to communities. And I guess the final principle is about um, outcome focused practice being action oriented and considering what needs to happen next. So next slide, please. Also in the uh, work we've just completed, we considered the wider evidence around outcome focused practice and what the barriers and gaps are. So what makes this different? I mean, shouldn't we all be working like this? But there are some real barriers and systems that make this kind of work challenging to do. And some of the practice barriers include a plethora of navigating and competing, navigating the competing priorities and models that are out there. And quite often we have policy developments, which again can come in with good intentions, but can be quite confusing. So I guess part of the work we do is try to look at if you practice in this way, what other what other um, policies are you responding to? So trying to join policy up and make it easier for practitioners. Um, as I've already said, the transition from a service-led way of thinking, what do we need to do to fix you, to thinking about what is really important to you, quite a big um, challenge. There's also, I think, particularly in the current context coming through COVID and with a lot of services having closed down temporarily or beginning to close up, open up again, maybe not a great deal of support and services out there. So for practitioners, there can be a fear of raising expectations, but we are always trying to emphasize that the conversation in itself can be an important intervention. A good conversation can change outcomes for carers. And there can also be a fear of stirring up carer emotions. System barriers wise, um, service-led resource prior prioritization. So we have eligibility criteria in Scotland, which mean that Sometimes practitioners are pushed back to emphasizing deficits to make the case for service. Some of our measurement priorities aren't that helpful, key performance indicators, which are not very congruent with the outcomes important to caters, and then commissioning processes, which um, is a whole other story for another day. So if we can move on to the next slide. Um, what supports the conversation? So again, this is multidisciplinary practitioners telling us this, as well as some of the evidence that's published around personal outcomes for carers. So the time to talk is really important. So while we can um, support practitioners to use limited amounts of time in the best way possible, really, I think there's an issue about um, the importance of conversations and relationship building not really being that well understood or valued in some of our systems. And so there is an argument to be made and a case to be made. And I think we're really trying to bring as much evidence as we can to make the case to have that space to talk. It is so important. But within organisations, um, practitioners need the opportunity, not just for initial training around this, but continuing practice development and opportunities for reflective practice. Time to think and time to talk with other practitioners is really important too. Being connected to peers, um, this is values-based practice and being connected to peers who share those values is fundamentally important too. It's interesting because we spoke a lot earlier about, I've heard people talking about peer support for carers, there's almost a case for peer support for practitioners too. Um, and I guess, you know, there are bits of systems and processes that quite often need to align around this way of working. So recording tools and so on. And we have collected lots of examples of those over time, which all of our uh, materials are available to um, share freely with people. 
Um, courage and determination was uh, something that some of the practitioners brought up. And also this needs to be a whole system approach. And of course, shifting a whole system or a whole organization around this way of working does take time, but I don't think anyone's ever said it wasn't time well spent. And changing the conversation in the organization as a whole, practitioners need to feel that they are valued and listened to if they want to practice that way. So if we move on to the next slide, and I'm very conscious that I'm talking too long, so I'll try to be quick. Um, so just a few reflections from the last workshop we had. This was um, some of the practitioners. This is from the chat box. It was an online workshop. And so I've just copied a chunk of it into the slide to let you see some of the chat that was going on between them. And this kind of comes in in the middle of the conversation, but one of them is saying there, I think the good conversations approach needs to be shared across the board. It's not just focusing on supported people, but on health and social care staff too, to help achieve the cultural shift. And the bit in there about workers often feel they don't have agency. Um, and I think that's true. There's something about um, staff being able to, um, to, to talk freely about what their concerns are and to, to get the support that they need to practice in this way. And so I guess it's about practice makes perfect and having the opportunity to take part in sessions where people can talk about the practice and reflect on it and exchange ideas and about role modeling. Um, so in the Personal Outcomes Network, which is our used to be our face-to-face -face network in Scotland, we're returning to face-to-face -face in a few months time, but we always took care to role model the approach. So we don't approach our sessions with the idea that we are experts as researchers. We approach with the idea of the exchange model that everyone in the room is bringing their knowledge and expertise of their context. And it's through blending those perspectives that we reach a better understanding of how to improve things um, collectively. Uh, again, the practitioner here is saying that whole system approach is key, that workers need to know they're supported in using this approach, including support from regulators and inspectors and other bodies. So we also work with the National Care Inspectorate in Scotland um, to try to support a shift in how uh, services are regulated. Um, and then finally, we have a practitioner here saying very interested in how we put the practical steps in place to support staff, not just the training and awareness of good conversations and how to have them, but the steps to do this within the messiness of real lives and the reflective time to learn and grow as professionals. Everyone is so busy and under pressure, frontline and managers, that it can be difficult to protect that genuinely honest, open learning space. And I think, you know, for all of us coming through the pandemic, having these uh, reflective spaces is more valuable than ever. So can we go on to the next slide, please? Yeah, so as I was mentioning, this uh, approach is based on the long-term exchange between research policy and practice in Scotland over many years. And the Personal Outcomes Network, we have, I think we're back up to about 320 members at the moment, but very diverse researchers, practitioners, um, policy. We have people from Scottish government come in sometimes with particular questions or contributions to make. And we also have carers who attend sessions as well. Um, so the network's been really important and able to, to enable that kind of long-term exchange between these different stakeholders. And we also connect with colleagues in Wales um, around their developing evidence-enriched practice model. And they've actually developed that model that you see there is based around the exchange model. So you've got people, research, policy, and practice. So again, that focus on storytelling and also dialogue as a way of changing practice. So if we move on to the next slide, please. And this is just to touch on, it kind of fits with a lot of the stuff we've been hearing about today around the global carer convert, the global voices of caregiving, I should say, and around use of photo voice. Um, as it happens, we've been doing work with colleagues at Bangor University in Wales around using images to open up carer conversations. And in that research, we're specifically looking at um, short breaks for carers, which um, is uh, an agenda that's developing in both Wales and Scotland just now and trying to think as creatively as possible about how to work with carers around the outcomes important to them 
and then thinking about the type of break that would help them to achieve their outcome. And again, we need to not make assumptions that carers will automatically know what they want um, to get out of a break or what type of break is possible. So I guess using the images is a way of opening up different ideas and changing the conversation. So um, we've started the research during lockdown periods and had some sessions online with practitioners and with carers to see how they responded to the use of images. And um, the, actually it was very, very positive and we got some excellent feedback about what would help in practice to make this effective. So some of the images are around types of short break. If we go on to the next slide, some of them are about thinking about outcomes. So is it important to the carer to just do, actually to have a bit of time to do absolutely nothing and to just relax and zone out as one carer said to us, is it important um, to them to have some exercise and um, to think about their health and well-being, or to spend time with a friend. Um, but also we, we have included some emotion cards because the emotional side of caring can be overlooked. And while it might be slightly daunting for someone who doesn't have the time to have that conversation, actually being able to express emotion can be such an important part of um, developing a plan that's going to be effective. So if we move on to the next slide, I guess that's a very quick overview of work we've been doing for quite a long time in Scotland. I hope that what I presented makes sense because I'm aware that I've missed lots of bits of the story out um, in order not to, to provide too much information. Um, but I'd be very happy for anyone to get in touch if they're interested in finding out more information. Um, we do have a website which is um, geared for practitioners supporting both people with support needs and carers so there's information for both but there's information on the website there's sections on conversations there's a section on recording and um, some of the outputs from the meetings that we have are there too um, but also if anyone's interested in um, finding out more, feel free to get in touch by email. I also use the dreaded Twitter, not very effectively, um, but I do have a Twitter handle. Um, and I've just included a few of our recent publications here, um, including one which is about the outcome focused conversations and, the, and I'm pulling together all the evidence on that, um, which is currently under review. Um, and then we have another recent publication, which is about short breaks and making short breaks meaningful and thinking about the outcomes around those. So yeah, that's it. And I'm kind of hand back to um, the conference now and happy to answer any questions. I haven't been able to see the chat box, so I don't know whether anyone's already raised anything. Thank you, Emma. That was a great presentation and such a great introduction to this topic. Um, I want to invite everyone from the audience now that has a question to submit that through the Q&A because we do have some time now um, to have a bit of a discussion while we have Emma with us about this. Um, and maybe to get us started, um, I can pose a question to you, Emma, which is that um, you mentioned peer support for providers, um, that practitioners needed support from their peers around this. And I'm curious if, if you can speak a a little more to how providers in Scotland are learning about caregiving and care needs and preferences and how to have these conversations. How is that happening? So, um, well, I guess one of the forums is there are there are different forums with different focuses. So, for example, there's a forum on person centered care. Um, there are national care organizations in Scotland which provide opportunities for learning exchange. Um, but I guess I can talk most about our personal outcomes network and how we support practitioners there. And um, one of the things that I think is really helpful is perhaps not to, I guess, again, it's about modeling the practice that we're trying to promote. So rather than promoting specific tools and techniques, we find that opening up a space for people to bring their concerns and the things that they're struggling with can sometimes be most effective. So 
in our network, we always have some kind of presentation or input to stimulate conversation, but actually then we always have um, roundtable discussions where people can then take that stimulus, make sense of it in the context of their own practice, exchange with the people sitting at their table, well, we find this really helpful in helping what we're doing in our organisation, and also say, we found that particular development really unhelpful so people can learn what not to do as well as what to do. Um, but I guess that having space to reflect on practice and to exchange with peers can be very affirming in itself and can give people new ideas um, and, and open up new ways of thinking. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, Lauren. Thank you. I, I think it does shed some light on it. And I want to share a comment that Cindy shared in the comments um, as you were speaking. Um, Cindy responded saying, I like that idea of having an open space for people to explore their pain points on caring. Thanks, Emma. Um, I have another question for you around sort of um, this shift that you talked about, you talked about it like a cultural shift um, and that sometimes practitioners or providers um, struggle to make that transition and it can be um, due to factors that are outside of their personal practice, you know, things happening in the systems and environments around them that make it difficult sometimes to have this time with families and carers um, and to engage in this process. So uh, it did make me think as you were talking about barriers about the US context that NAC operates in and the barrier of payment and reimbursement. Um, so we know in the US that there are limited ways for providers to gain reimbursement for time spent with families um, in certain settings and with caregivers specifically. Um, so what does this look like in Scotland? Can you speak a little bit to um, that, that piece of this? Yeah, yeah, I can actually. And I, I'm aware of that context of reimbursement in the States. It's come up before in relation to mental health caregiving. Um, and what I would say is that in Scotland, so I mentioned eligibility criteria earlier, which have a kind of similar effect, even though we're talking about a different system, in that eligibility criteria, and particularly in social care service, they don't operate in health, but in social care services, there is a requirement to reach a specific threshold. And um, so you want to be in critical or substantial, sometimes only critical need actually when things are really tight, to be, in, to, to, to be able to demonstrate critical needs in order to be able to access resource and support. And, and this is a real barrier. And, it's, and, a, and actually what happens is because practitioners are required to hit a bar of showing how negative and dreadful everything is in order to access resource, it's, it's detrimental. It's detrimental to the carer and the family because their strengths are undermined and have to be ignored. Um, but also it tends to lead people into to, to be stuck in the types of resource that they consider it. it stifles creativity in terms of thinking about how to achieve outcomes. So it's a long term struggle in the UK with eligibility criteria and we are currently setting up a project in Scotland in the context of our new national care service to tackle eligibility criteria and to look at what the alternatives are. So we're being quite tentative because we can't say that we're going to come up with an alternative model but what we are doing in the series of conversations that are starting in June is to, with a very diverse stakeholders is to look at where organisations are working around eligibility criteria and working really well around them, how they're doing that and to what effect. And we actually have a speaker from Wales come in as well as a speaker from England. Um, and these are organisations where they are really focusing on strengths, capabilities and maximising those, looking at being more uh, creative and resourceful linking people into resources in the community, as well as costed resources, um, and, and, and looking at the evidence for what impact that's having. So we're hopeful that we can you know, contribute to a, a change in direction. We can't say that we're gonna come up with an alternative model, but we've got, we've got fabulous examples of how people are managing to do that. So I guess bringing those together is a way of bringing, uh, we're, we're, uh, also treating it as a research um, opportunity 
and we'll be collating that evidence and presenting it. So it's it's in order to help support that shift. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers the question a little bit. Don't have an, an actual answer yet, but we're trying. Thank, thank you for sharing that. And also, you know, what's coming next? Um, it's that's exciting and, and meaningful work that you're going to be able to actually explore some of this um, in the future. I want to go now to a question that has come through our Q&A box from Danielle. Um, Danielle said, I love that you mentioned the importance of giving space to express emotions as part of this process of making a plan for what's next. Can you share more about what that looks like when working with caregivers? So if I understand the question right, um, it's about that, that someone is saying that they like the idea of um, opening up and encouraging the expression of emotions. Um, and I guess what we're doing partly through this, we do have a couple of existing tools that help with that actually. So if anyone wants to contact me about those tools that were developed by a carer centre in Scotland, I'm happy to do that. But in relation to the research that I described using images and using emotion cards as part of that, they are actually based on work done by NHS Education Scotland around um, a carer a journey conversations, which is, is an existing set of prompts, which include emotion cards. They're already tried and tested with people who have gone through hospital journeys, for example, not so much with carers. So this gives us an opportunity, this research process gives us an opportunity to consider how those emotional prompts, how they work in practice. And particularly given that practitioners have expressed a fear of carer emotions uh, coming up. So working with those practitioners to build their confidence and not perhaps to be less afraid of emotions or to feel that they've done something wrong if they stood up carer emotions, but that actually it can be a helpful part of the process. So we will be gathering evidence from carers and from practitioners about using those prompts as we go through the research process. And again, happy to share the findings of that. That's really helpful. And I, I'm grateful for you naming that because I think it speaks to what you were saying earlier around peer support for providers, um, that peer support for caregivers can be important, um, but that providers need support around engaging in this process um, and identifying that fear is um, sounds like really critical for providing some support. Um, we have a couple more questions that have come through the chat and it does look like we have another few minutes um, to address them. Um, the first comes from Anil um, and he asked if you could share and this is a big question, so I hope it's fair to ask if you can share a little bit about um, capturing and tracking outcomes. Um, it's something you mentioned just briefly in your presentation. Okay, so um, that's actually something in a in a longer presentation. I would have quite a lot. To, it's one of my favorite subjects, actually. So I'd have quite a lot to say about that. But there's a few key principles about tracking and capturing outcomes. So I guess one thing is to and think. We don't really talk about measuring outcomes because so, so there's a thing about contribution and attribution first of all we can't really attribute outcomes to specific interventions really because life is messy and complex and all sorts of things might contribute to a career outcome so we tend to talk more about contrib contributions towards outcomes and that can be quite helpful because it means that say for example a carer is um struggling with their mental health or they're not sleeping and their biggest concern is or the biggest outcome is I want to be able to relax I want to be able to sleep so that I feel better and that I have the energy to have a good life there may be several contributions required to achieve that outcome um, and that may be involve something that the carer themselves is doing so thinking about contribution allows different um, people to be contributing to the same outcome which is quite important um, also, I think with tracking outcomes over time, so we, we have tools, we do have tools which enable that there are categories of outcomes and you can, you can tick boxes to say one to 10, how a carer feels at a given time. So it's possible to do that. But we would also argue that you would always want to have some kind of narrative to support the numbers, because what does that outcome mean to that carer and how do we make sure we're not making assumptions about what the numbers mean? So um, I guess with tracking outcomes over time, if you are going to use um, 
number or similar, then you want to think about other forms of data to support that. So, um, and I guess another key thing is that we would challenge the assumption that higher scores are always what you would be seeking with outcomes, that sometimes maintaining an outcome at the same level can be a very significant achievement um, and that we need to acknowledge that. But also for a lot of caring situations, slowing the rate of deterioration for a particular outcome for a carer may also be an achievement. Um, particularly when a carer is dealing with an end-of-life situation or, or something like that. So, yeah, some com complexities around tracking outcomes, but we do have quite a lot of, um, again, information that we'd be happy to share around that too. That's great. Thank you. And in our last few, um, our last minute here together, um, I just wanted to ask you if you could share um, a first step or an action step that anybody who's listening, who's interested in this kind of practice, wants to find a little more information, um, and, and we don't have time to answer every question here, where would you direct them? How can they get started? Well, they could. Um, so we have quite a lot of information on our website. It's probably not the best designed website in the world because I did quite a lot of it, but um, you know, it's the best that we could manage. So that you, the Personal Outcomes Network, if you Google that, you should be able to land on that website. And there is quite a lot of information there. You can also connect with the Personal Outcomes Network. And we don't send out a great deal of information because we don't want to fill up people's inboxes. But then you would hear about any new resources that we're producing um, and things like that. And I also don't mind people dropping an email, um, you know, if there's a specific question or a specific resource that somebody was interested in, I'd be happy to respond by email to that. Um, yeah, so hopefully that answers that question. That's a great start. And I want to thank you um, again for your presentation and then for answering so many questions for us. I've just dropped the link to your website, the Personal Outcomes Network, um, into the chat. Um, so there's lots of resources there. That's a good place to start for folks who have additional questions. Um, and they can also get in touch with you because you've shared your email with us. So thank you so much. Appreciate you joining us. Thank you, Lauren.